you're on air. All right, well, good evening. I call the 2,364th meeting of the Milwaukee City Council to order. This meeting is being conducted in person at City Hall and by video conference. The public may participate in this meeting by coming to City Hall, joining the Zoom webinar, or watching on the city's YouTube channel or Comcast cable channel 30 in city limits. <clears throat> there will be opportunities for the public to speak during this meeting. If you would like to address council, you may come to city hall. However, city, however, seating in the chambers is limited. If you're interested in speaking, please let staff know by emailing ocr at milwaukeeoregon.gov for those on Zoom or by submitting a yellow comment card for those in city hall. When it is time to take public comments, staff will monitor the comment cards, the email inbox, Zoom participant list, and chat. We will take comments in the order that they are received and seen. Written comments may be emailed to ocr at milwaukeeoregon.gov. <clears throat> the public may also participate in Zoom webinar by phone by dialing 1-253-215-8782, entering webinar ID 841-6722-7661, and passcode 09-7479. If you're calling in through Zoom and would like to make a comment, dial star nine to raise your hand. <clears throat> Spanish translation services are available upon request. The public is asked to request translation or other meeting accessibility services at least 48 hours before the meeting. Contamos con servicio de traducción al español cuando se es solicitado. Se pide al público que solicite servicios de traducción y otros servicios de accesibilidad para reuniones uh, por lo menos 48 horas antes de la reunión. Translation services are also available in other languages. All right, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The city of Milwaukee respectfully acknowledges that our community is located on the ancestral homeland of the Clackamas people. In 1855, the surviving members of the Clackamas signed at the Willamette Valley Treaty, also known as the Kalapuya Etc. Treaty, with the federal government in good faith. We offer our respect and gratitude to the indigenous people of this land. <clears throat> All right, tonight's announcements. Learn about playground design, safety, and play concepts, including nature-based, inclusive, and sensory-based at Playground Design presentation on Thursday, September 22nd, from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. The knowledge that you gain will help you provide informed feedback during the upcoming park planning processes. The presentation will be done virtually using Zoom. Attend a conversation with Kate Birdsall on Thursday, September 22nd from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. at the Letting Library. Kate is the author of the memoir, In Between and Stars, in the 2022 film, Strictly for the Birds. Help welcome the city's newest public mural created by Kanani Miyamoto on Saturday, September 24th from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. The event will include brief remarks and refreshments. The mural is located on the post office building on South Main Street and all are welcome to attend. City Manager Ann Ober is hosting another open door session on Thursday, September 27th from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. No sign up is necessary and sessions are first come first served. Sessions take place at City Hall here in the council chambers. The October Letting Library lecture series presents Chris Rempel, a culture, uh, cultural education specialist for the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde and a special address from City Councilor Adam Kajabadi. The event takes place in person at Letting Library, but there is an option to also attend virtually using Zoom, or you can watch the recording later. Um, let's see, your scarecrows are due September 30th, I believe. 
And uh, Sin Wax is the uh, contact here at City Hall. Yep. Um, what was the other thing? Oh, Davis Graveyard. Davis Graveyard. We'll start there. Go ahead. Their annual Halloween amazing display, um, uh, October 1st. So for more information about each of these events and others, please visit the city's homepage at milwaukeeoregon.gov or call 503-786-7555. All right, uh, our next item is the Milwaukee High School Outstanding Student Award. This will be presented for the first time by the new Milwaukee High School principal, Kim Kellogg. Awesome. Well, my name is Kim Kellogg, and I'm the new principal at Milwaukee High School, Milwaukee Academy of the Arts. Um, I've been in the district for 27 years. Um, I started off at Rex Putnam High School, and I was a teacher for 10 years. I went on to be a high school, um, uh, kind of school to careers coordinator, assistant principal. Then I went to the elementary, and I was a principal for six years, and then came back to high school um, last year and um, got to work at Milwaukee High School and moved into the principalship this year. So that's a little bit about who I am. But today, we're here to honor um, Annalise. And I got to meet Annalise last year um, as a junior at the end of the year when she started, um, she was talking with a counselor about this project. And um, I just want to tell you a little bit, we're going to get in there and she's going to give you a, um, a little bit of an overview too. All right. So one thing when we're looking for our student of the month, our outstanding student, we're looking for someone who contributes to the community, someone who gives back. Um, and then we're also looking for someone who strives to make a difference in their community and academics or activities or their passion areas. Um, or we're also looking at someone who maybe has overcome an obstacle and is just showing that strength, that perseverance and that um, kind of making a change in, in their life. And, um, and so Annalise is, is doing a number of these pieces. She is, has excellence in her academics. She is giving back to her community. She has developed a, um, a kind of a new club to give back um, to her community as well. And she's gonna talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, so a little bit about Annalise, you can see in here, she's a senior, she's a four point student. She's a co-president of the of student government. She is a co-president of um, the NHS. Um, she is a three sport athlete. Um, she developed what was she, she's the, she's the founder of Community Force. Um, and it was a, a little bit to give back, wanting to get students excited about volunteering and giving back to their community. Um, and she also, in all of that, she finds time to work as well. I don't know how she does, does that all. Um, one of the things I asked um, staff about um, Annalise, what are some words that you would use to describe Annalise? And everything kind of comes um, about the same theme. Um, it is about, she's a responsible young lady. She's always willing to help out. She's been a team player, kind, um, hardworking, always from a very young age. That um, uh, one of our teachers, Mr. Elv said, you know, I've known Annalise for a couple of years as a member of National Honor Society, and she's emerged as a leader from the start. She's extremely motivated to serve her community and organize events for others to help out. We're all very fortunate to have um, such a motivated student at MHS. Um, Annalise um, earned um, Excellence in Biology Award last year for consistent um, and quality work in AP Biology. She would regularly contact me outside of class, give feedback on her work, and always take advantage of making improvements to her assignments. I appreciate her commitment to her academics and her contributions to her class. Um, Mr. Peterson, Annalise is a fantastic student. She has a great commitment to everything she does. Um, she is a joy to have in class. She's smart, funny, and engaging, and the future is very bright for Annalise. And then Mr. Schaefer, I love this one too. There's, there were many more comments, but I love this one. Annalise is one of those students who um, sees, sees something and gets it done. She's a great talent for overcoming challenges, um, staying positive, and caring about uh, others um, enough to sacrifice her time and energy and making things better. 
She is just as good of a student as she is a person and, re and she represents us well. She's a true Mustang and she um, definitely um, deserves the student of the month recognition. Um, she, I just feel like um, in working with Annalise, she has just been such a positive person and wanting to do better for the community and, and making it a better place. And so when I said that I met her last year, um, it was about this parking lot um, project idea. And um, I'm gonna let her talk a little bit about that, but the thing that, that caught me when she talked about it is like, the city of Milwaukee has a lot of beautiful art and murals and just that, that feel and wanting to really tie Milwaukee to the community. Um, and so she had this idea and um, we'll let you go from there. Um, <laughs> Since COVID and everything happened, we lost kind of like a little bit of that connection with the Milwaukee community and Milwaukee high school is like, what makes our high school so special is that we do have such a strong connection with our community. And after COVID and everything, I really wanted to not only build that stronger connection among our senior class, but also just back with the community. And I love how in Milwaukee, we have so many bright and beautiful murals that I wanted to like brighten, like not only the seniors at Milwaukee and other students there, but also just people that are passing by and walking through, just seeing any like mural just can brighten anyone's day and it makes me happy going to school and other students. So that was why I wanted to do it, just to bring the everyone at Milwaukee closer together, especially the seniors, since we did lose some senior activities, and then also just pulling in people from the community. And so one of the things that Annalise talked about, she not only, um, she started working on this in the spring and I said, well, that isn't something that we just get to decide. I wish it was, it would have made it a lot easier. But then she um, put together a presentation and presented to um, our facilities a community. And also then that went to um, our senior um, exec team and they approved kind of that um, uh, painting of the, um, pieces, but Annalise went through and I just want to show, um, she put, this is the presentation. We're not going to go through it all. Um, let's see if it wants to come up. That's what I got too. I didn't get in it. It's not going, <laughs> okay. Well, she um, put in there about kind of what the cost, she knew, she did the research about what the paint was, what needed to be done to the parking lot before she could put that down. What would happen? Um, how would, how would she elicit, um, information from the seniors about um, how to get started, how to submit your designs, um, the cost so that it would offset. She did the fundraising to pay for all the paint. Um, she got um, food donated for food and snacks for the kids who came. Um, she also wanted to put that if there was someone, cause she said, I wanna have that it be a $10 so we can offset the cost a little bit, but anyone who couldn't afford that, then she was like, we've got that taken care of. Um, she looked at, um, we were worried about the paint and that it being um, slippery and someone could get hurt. So she did the research around that, about what type of paint needed to be used for that. And then she worked on the communication to send out to the community um, and then gave all the, here's the tips, here's the do's, the don'ts, and here's how you submit everything. So she had it all covered. And so I just wanted to share with you kind of some of the results of that if you haven't had a, chance to be in our parking lot. Um, there was a submission form. Okay, let's hope the video will, will work. Any suggestions here? Okay. The show is on here. I'm just gonna go for it. Any help on this one? That's a little arrow for a video. I saw my other window. I saw a video come up, so. I saw the two. Uh, let's keep. There it goes. There it is. For the YouTube audience, let's see if we can pull that up. Share. It's only a minute long, so you can just kind of see a little bit of Annalise's work oh, that. Oh. Is there a volume? Or is it just music? Yeah, it's, there's music oh. too, but it's, it's okay. But... Okay, I don't know if we get the volume. But... All right. Well, there was music to it, but that's okay. You can still see kind of the work that. Wow. It's really cool. So when was the painting done? It was on the 29th, right? Uh, yeah, I think it was the 29th and I think the 1st of yes. September. Yeah, 29th. Okay. 
Santa Lee said plan to have it do the base paint on the 29th, give it time to dry, and then two days later, um, the students came in and did their designs. And so that's just some of the, the work that the kids did. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, yeah. So. Very cool. So that's kind of um, some of the, the pieces. Do you have other things you want to add about um, Community Force? Why don't you tell them a little bit about your organization of that? So um, me and my friend, Jillian Kedahy, we were in, uh, we're the co-presidents along with another member of NHS. And um, last year we noticed like a big like decrease in like people not being able to find volunteer hours, especially because of like after COVID again, like there's been a lot of like, there's, there was been a lack of opportunity because of COVID, but um, also people weren't as excited to volunteer anymore. And so we wanted to have community force to like get people excited. Like if sometimes it can be awkward, like going to volunteer somewhere when it's just by yourself. So that's why we did this. So like it can be a group thing and we make volunteering fun because personally I like to volunteer and so does my other friend, Jillian. And so that's why we got together and started that club. And it just brought everyone together. And so far we've had a couple of things. We started last semester and we did like painting rocks and we put those around Milwaukee, the community. You might be able to find some still, we put some by. And then um, we made some like cards for kids. And yeah, it's just been a lot of fun and I'm excited to do more things this year. So we'll open it up to you guys if you have any questions for Annalise. All right. Uh well, uh, often we ask what your, uh, what your future plans are. So what are you thinking about after high school? Um, after high school, I want to attend like a four-year university. And I'm either planning on staying in Oregon or hope, I think it would be fun to like broaden out and go to like the East Coast. And I'm super excited just to, I'm deciding whether to major in like film or biology. I'm super excited just to like get studying and everything. Nice. All right, cool. All right, well, we usually take turns. Who would like to go first? <clears throat> I'll go first. Uh, so Ms. Kellogg said that she has the teachers to describe you with, you know, different words. What three words were you, would you use to describe yourself and why? Um, I think I would describe myself as one just optimistic because, and driven and probably funny because um, I often like, there can, everyone can be placed in like a difficult situation. And I try to always see like the brighter side to it. And also like with that, just like driving, like to just keep ongoing and everything and also trying to like if something like sad or something happens that's not the best like just trying to see like a funny out but trying to make people laugh and like when there's a tough situation um, <laughs> um, don't rehearse this <laughs> uh, yeah we, we definitely don't rehearse this well you're a really impressive young lady and I'm uh, kind of it's kind of nice to know that you haven't uh, entirely decided where you want to go and you're exploring a lot of options I think that's an exciting part of being a high school senior and um, and also not pinning down a major. I actually didn't declare a major till I was a junior. <laughs> so I, I know that's harder these days than it was back then, but um, um, so I think it's, you've got some really exciting opportunities ahead. And um, I really want to thank you for the kind of community building that's so important after COVID. I mean, it's so important all the time, but after COVID in particular, and it's great that you sort of had the, insight to see that and um, take that by the horns. And um, and it's also cool that you're inspired by the murals in Milwaukee. I think we need to let our art committee know about that because they did a lot of work to get those murals up. So it's great to have the high school joining in that um, sense of community. So best of luck to you. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing where you do end up going. <laughs> Uh, I had two questions for you. One is a really practical one, and I'll do that one second. And then the other one is just, it's the beginning of the school year. We're relatively out of the pandemic, or at least we're pretending like we're out of it mostly. So what are you, what are you hoping to have as a, an experience this year? What, what didn't you get to do? Or, you know, it's your last year mm -hmm. at MHS. So what are you looking forward to? 
I'm really looking forward to just like student government. I'm a part of that and just like planning all the events with all the students, especially now that like we can be closer together, don't have to stay six feet apart. It's really fun and I'm excited just for everything, especially like games too, like don't like soccer games. We used to like not be able to, like we had to stay six feet away and everything. So I'm really excited just to like have fun events at the school again and then play sports just closer to everyone. Yeah, that's great. And my other question was, are you, do you need, are you interested in suggestions for volunteering opportunities or do you have? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a loaded question. Yeah. No, yeah, we're always looking for volunteer opportunities just to like give out to everyone in the group. And like I myself, I'm always looking for opportunities. So definitely looking for opportunities. Okay, well, I'll, yeah. uh, I'll be in touch with uh, Principal Kellogg there because mm -hmm. I'm sure, I mean, we all know of a million of them, anything from like four hours of cleaning up mm -hmm. in one of the local parks or doing an Ivy pole to making Valentine's Day cards for Meals on Wheels uh, seniors who are receiving meals delivered to them. So we'll, we'll be in touch. Awesome. awesome. Thank you for all you're doing. Yeah. Awesome. And I, I actually would like to ask, uh, do you like where do you see the community force going? Do you do you see it expanding to other high schools and, and you guys partnering with other high schools to do the same work? Um, we're not partnering with other high schools at the moment, but I'm thinking of it as if you've heard of Key Club. I know Clackamas High School does Key Club, and it's very similar to that. Um, we just wanted to put like our own spin on it, I guess, for Mock High School. And I'm hoping that next year we'll continue to go on, and then we can have like a junior be the new like president of Community Force. So I'm really hoping that it continues after this year, especially. And um, I hope that we get to do more events this year. Like, I want us to do more things. And um, I know we're already talking about maybe doing like a fundraiser for Community Force and do donating those funds. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate what you're doing. And, and you know, this is, uh, this is what leading by example looks like. Um, and this is what the next generation of leadership is gonna look like. So we appreciate it. Uh, you're somebody that people are gonna look to, younger generations are gonna look to as well. And just keep it up. Uh, don't let that light die out. Keep shining. I have one more question. How's the cell phone ban going this year? <laughs> how, how, do, how do you feel about it? Um, it hasn't been too much of a problem for me, really. I wasn't really on my phone in class, but I know some kids were a little frustrated with it. But also, it wasn't, it doesn't really, I haven't seen any issues with it because kids still can like, they're not like, you're not like, supposed to like use it in class, but like they still, like we have time to use the phones. And so I think there's like enough time to get to use it that at least in all of my classes, no kids have like been disrupting that rule. Everyone usually respects it. So I don't think it's been that much of a change. Yeah. Cool. Good question. <laughs> well, I've seen, I know, I know North Clackamas and I've seen some posts and stuff. I just wonder how kids are dealing with it in high school. Mm -hmm. I mean, because I know like in elementary and middle, well, I don't know what it's like in middle school, but in elementary school, kids didn't have, they had their phones, but they weren't on them. So last year, uh, last year, I felt like we had phones everywhere <laughs> all the time. Um, and this year we just decided we started off at day one saying, well, there's direct instruction. When there's that, we have signs. Some people are using those, um, but it's, it's, there's our times where with our technology and being able to do stuff in classroom with our technology, it makes sense, but everyone has the Chromebook so we can use that. Um, but we haven't had, I'm, I'm surprised that we haven't had more pushback. Maybe some wood somewhere. <laughs> so I, don't know, like, I, I don't know why I jinx myself like that. But, yeah. Well, you, uh, you're an extraordinary young woman. Uh, and I think Adam really hit it on the head. This is, this is what leadership looks like. And, and um, the world needs great, bright, positive uh, leaders like that. So whatever, whichever direction you end up going, um, there's opportunities, obviously, in both to be a leader and to make a change in the world. And uh, I, I look forward to seeing what you do. Um, when you were giving the presentation about the, all of the things she did to organize um, for the for the painting project, I was like, man, we should hire her at the city to <laughs> help run uh, the the Sunday Parkways thing or the not oh. carefree Sunday. Carefree Sunday. Sorry. Yes. <laughs>
Uh, she's yeah. amazing mm -hmm. and, and all of that. And about, you know, I'm, I would say, hey, we need to make some changes here and we'd look over it. She's a great collaborator as well. And that's one thing I don't think that we've necessarily I think goes with everything we've said, but great at collaboration and um, asking for feedback and input. And um, when we made some changes, she's like, okay, got it, I'm on it. It was done the next day, okay, here we go. And so I, I just feel like after we sat down again and listed all of the things that she's involved in, I'm like, <laughs> holy cow, how do you get all that done? <laughs> so, um, I, I really enjoyed um, getting to know Annalise this year, and I look forward to working with her um, throughout the year. So. Yeah, well, that, that ability to do way more than seems humanly possible will go well if you end up going into yes. film, because yeah. that's particularly in the early days when you're involved in smaller projects, everyone works on everything a lot. Yes. <laughs> or government. Yes. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, the city of Milwaukee is proud to recognize for outstanding student achievement in academics, civic, civic engagement, and extracurricular activities at Milwaukee High School, Annalise Kronk. Let it be known to all that, uh, to, to all that on this 20th day of September, 2022, City Council of the City of Milwaukee, a municipal corporation in the County of Clackamas in the state of Oregon, recognize this student as an excellent example of the bright future of this community and nation. Thank you. First one of these, it's, um, I wasn't sure what to um, prepare for. So, um, and I think too, just starting off with, you know, being my first year as the Milwaukee High School principal and Milwaukee Academy of the Arts, I had the um, privilege of working with Carmen last year and learned a ton um, leading up to this year. Um, and so I think we're taking things that we were working on last year and I just wanted to talk about what are our main goals that we're focus on, focusing on and starting there. But before I start that, this year we, I built a schedule um, based on um, a, uh, about 1,149 and currently as of today we're at uh, 1,283 students. Wow. wow. And so um, right now we have 324 students at Milwaukee Academy of the Arts and we have about 959 um, students at Milwaukee High School. And so the combination of, of um, both schools in one. Is that higher for the Academy yeah. of the Arts? Um, we're, we can have up to 400 students in Milwaukee Academy of the Arts, kind of 100 um, students per um, uh, class or grade level. And so we actually are at 101 <laughs> at the ninth grade level, so. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to look back at and what we're looking at the data. I put 1920, kind of our graduation rates um, of on-time graduation. Um, we were at 85% um, at Milwaukee High School and 87% at Milwaukee Academy of the Arts. And kind of our state average is 80%. So that's something that we're continuing to, to work on and um, to build towards and to increase. Um, and then for our, um, everything, I always think of big umbrellas um, as far as the things that we stand for. Um, with our core values, we try to really make our decisions around um, kind of that being student-centered. Is the decisions we're making, is it student-centered? Is it relationship-based? Um, is it about um, helping our students to be future ready? And then um, all about equity, um, diversity, and inclusion. And if we're making decisions or we have practices that um, are excluding um, or isn't um, based on our equity lens, then we need to think about if, why we're making that decision. So all of the pieces that we're going with are with those um, core values in mind. And so our SIP, which is our school improvement plan, um, really is focusing, we, we're doing a lot of work this year um, as we always do, but um, the four areas we're gonna be looking at ninth grade teams, 
um, we're really focusing on because we know um, the data really suggests that if um, students, when they enter into the ninth grade, if they don't, if they're not successful in their academics in English and math in particular, if they don't pass those courses, then the likelihood of graduating on time or if it at all is significantly diminished. And so we really look at, we've built ninth grade teams. And so we have um, all ninth graders are on a team uh, with a science or biology, no, whew, physics teacher, um, math teacher, and an English teacher. And so those three teachers share the same like 100 students. And so when um, I built the schedule this year, it's would kind of talking about systems and how do we build that community um, and that it, I want students to know they're on a team and these are their teachers and this is a, a community. Um, so they have uh, all their classes on one day and they can take even like, if it's a first and second period class, they can combine their classes and um, see all their kids in that one period and then have their students do a project based um, um, in the third period. Or they can say, if I need to do some reteaching on some of the content that I had, but I need these three, I need this group of students from all three of my classes, I can do that. So it's talking about having our systems support our students and the work that we're doing. Um, because we know sometimes students, we need to meet our students where they're at and what they need. And sometimes we need to do reteaching. Sometimes, sometimes we need to look at things a little bit differently. Um, we're really looking at um, student engagement and those engagement practices within our classrooms. Um, and as a district, we're looking at um, this whole like talk structures and how do we engage in a higher level discussion and um, one of the pieces we're doing is we're centering all of our work around that engagement in our class. How do we do that a little bit differently? Coming back from COVID last year was um, tricky from being online and coming back in person. And how do I engage with this many people? I was online and now I have 35 students in my class. Um, and how do I interact? How do I um, kind of do that? So it's kind of like doing some more reteaching. We did that last year and we're focusing on that and going to that next level again this year about that engagement, having, them, having students know how to talk and how, know how to dis disagree in a respectful way, know how to, um, it won't be just the teacher asking the question, question, the student giving the response, but how do we engage with each other? And um, so that's one of the pieces there. We're really continuing to look at equitable grading practices. Um, we've been doing a lot of work over the last few years um, with these practices. And this year um, in our professional development at the beginning of the year, we looked at, we no longer will kind of go from that zero to a hundred scale. You have 60% um, of an opportunity to, to fail, but you only have 10% increments in order to achieve. And so what we're trying to do is even out those um, grading buckets um, per se that so that it's more evenly distributed um, about the grading for students. Also making it really clear about the grading is about what the student learning is. It's not about showing up. It's not about, you know, I turn this in. It's about what is that learning and how do we assess the learning that students are having? And does that grade really reflect the student learning? And so we're doing a, um, continuing our work with that. And I feel like um, at our professional development, we had this great conversation and it was different than the conversations maybe that we've had in the, you know, even the last five years, and you can probably speak to that too, Desi, but about, it is about the, um, it's not about, no, I'm not doing it. This is the way I'm, I'm grading. It's about how do I make that work? How do I explain that to students? How do I really, that grade really reflect the student's understanding of what we're teaching? And how do I help engage the students in that conversation as opposed to what do I need to do to get this A? What do I need to do to get this? And it's not about just the points, it's about the learning. And so we're trying to make that shift. And then we're also looking at our advanced placement, our AP classes, um, and looking at um, the demographic, our students that are taking AP classes and who's not taking AP classes and why. 
and what do we need to do with those classes in order to support our students. And the way we're doing that is we have an AP coordinator that this year that's looking at, we did um, um, equal opportunity schools, we did a survey and we got data back from our students saying, yes, I would like to take an AP class. And now we need to go through and say, and we did some work in the spring, but we wanna say how many of the students that said they wanted to take an AP class, did they actually um, forecast and enroll in one? And now that they're in it, how do we support our students when they're in the class? Because a lot of students will start it and then want, want to drop the, those courses. And so it's about what, what's the scaffolding that we're putting in place to support our students with the academic learning. Um, and then all the other umbrellas underneath are kind of some of the ways in which I was just um, explaining and trying to um, support those goals. So that that is it in a nutshell about what we're focusing on this year <laughs> and many, many other things too. So any questions or? I always have something to say about that. I would love to see more dual credit from mm -hmm. Clackamas Community College. So, yeah. you know, like kids are coming out with like an associate's degree yes. when they're graduating high school, especially if we're talking about grow your own pipelines for teachers, right? It would be mm -hmm. great to have kids be able to get that dual credit. Yeah. I don't know how close you all are. We do. We that. have a number of courses that are already receiving the dual um, credit. So like all of our Spanish classes are receiving dual oh. credit all the way through. We have... Um, what about education? Yeah. <laughs> and that's the, the piece too. I think Saban Schellenberg has a, um, a course that is doing some credit with kind of their early learning. And um, they have a, another class that they're doing about education. So I don't know enough about, about that program, but um, yeah. And I think too, that's within our, our teachers, within our building, our instructional assistants that are in our, our, our building also that are, um, we're trying to do that as well. So yeah, I agree. The dual credit in coming out with um, enough to have an associates and just the, the likelihood that someone will continue on with that is much stronger if, if you don't have that. Or even the first year's worth of credits, yes. right? It's, I mean, it's really, there's some really cool opportunities. And right. I was going to ask a similar thing, um, just in conversations that I'm currently having in all kinds of realms from the electricians unions to, you know, Clackamas County, uh, the, or to the, to the community college, it's just the opportunities to get, to help kids find opportunities earlier get them plugged in so that they're they're faced with a lot more chance you know chances to do something interesting or to do something very valuable with their lives instead of kind of this scary brick wall of wow I gotta you know borrow $120,000 to get a four-year degree so that I can make something of myself right mm -hmm. and there's just I think there's so many more opportunities out there and it would be really cool to coordinate try and see more of interaction between the community college and the various, you know, uh, other educational opportunities out there for, for kids looking at what they're going to do with the rest of their lives. Well, maybe next month when I get the opportunity to be here, I'll show you what we're doing in that area. Cool. So yeah, there, um, we have, a, have some things that we're doing there, and I'm pretty excited about that as well. So. Awesome. I'll, Get I'll those kids out. out of mom's basement. Move out. <laughs> <laughs> we look forward to it. Move out and remodel my bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> or rewire my or re right, rewire, rewire my, my house. attic. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you and congratulations again. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. I'll see you guys next month. All right. Our next item is uh, National Preparedness Month proclamation. This will be presented by uh, Councilor Beatty and Clackamas Fire Assistant Chief uh, Brian Stewart. So I'll kick it off, but it's really mostly going to be Chief Stewart. Um, I, you know, we have done this proclamation for a few years now. I don't think we really talk about preparedness enough. Um, we all know we have, I mean, we, we did talk about it a bit around the 
2020 wildfires. Um, but um, uh, I think, um, you know, helping the community get uh, better prepared for all eventualities, natural disasters, and, you know, sometimes other kinds of, of uh, things that require preparedness that aren't nat natural disasters. Um, is important and we've had uh, the CERT teams, the Milwaukee CERT teams, which are pretty active, come before uh, the last couple of years on this proclamation, but I thought it would be nice to switch it up and hear from the fire district uh, to spread a little word about what what's on their mind vis-a-vis -vis preparedness. Well, certainly. Uh, thank you so much for having me this evening. I appreciate the opportunity to be in front of the council. And thank you, Councillor Beatty, for the invitation to be here tonight. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I reflected. I looked at the, the proclamation uh, that's set to, to be considered by the council, and it made me reflect on a couple of things. And one of the terms that came to mind was partnership. And the partnership of being invited here, the partnership that we have uh, with city councilor and with uh, the interagency committee. Um, and those partnerships uh, bear fruit. With the recent wind event, uh, I know our fire chief was in contact with your, your city manager. And those things help prepare us for those, those short term things that we can see that are coming. And, and we work together between agencies to make sure that our response and our ability to mitigate those are, are appropriate. But I also realize that there's a gap there's a gap in our ability as a fire district to provide all the services that are going to be requested in times of uh, catastrophe or emergency. There's a gap in the ability of the city of Milwaukee, the city of, or the, the county, whatever agency, there's always a gap in our ability to respond to the multitudes of calls and the capacity that's needed. And so our goal, my goal uh, as a fire agency representative is to reaffirm the importance of preparedness. Um, we want people to feel secure. We want people to feel comfortable in their lives and that they're prepared for uh, eventuality, for possibility. Um, that when they put their kids to bed at night, when they go to work, when they're commuting, that they understand that they're empowered to respond to what their local needs are. Uh, and I think in the proclamation, it speaks to a 72 hour kit and those types of things that should be in the car and should be at home and, and along those routes. So it's, it's important that we have these conversations and it's important that, that councils and, and our board took action on a proclamation as well, because it, it demonstrates levity. It demonstrates the gravity of uh, the circumstance that isn't in front, of, in front of us today, but that may be in front of us tomorrow or next week or in five years. Um, so by the, the council considering this tonight, uh, it helps encourage the partnerships and the education that we put forward and the activities that we as an organization um, collaborate on. Uh, so I appreciate the, the undertaking uh, and the importance and the, the opportunity to be here this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to read the proclamation or do you want me to? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Whereas the month of September is recognized by emergency responders and public safety agencies nationwide as a time to actively promote emergency preparedness in our communities through planned activities, events, and public awareness campaigns. And whereas the theme of this year's National Preparedness Month is a lasting legacy, recognizes the importance of creating plans to respond to natural disasters to be better prepared to protect ourselves and our communities against both immediate crises and their residual effects. And whereas emergency preparedness is the responsibility of everyone, and all are urged to work together to ensure that individuals, families, neighborhoods, businesses, and communities are prepared for disasters and emergencies of any type. And whereas investing in personal and community preparedness can reduce injuries, fatalities, and economic devastation in our community and in our nation. And whereas during September, the city of Milwaukee urges residents to prepare themselves for emergencies by assembling an emergency go kit, including three days of water, medications, and other emergency supplies by enrolling in communication platforms to receive emergency alerts and by learning about regional and statewide evacuation procedures, which you can find at www.clackamasfire.com and www.oregon.gov slash OEM. 
Now, therefore, I, Mark Gamba, Mayor of the City of Milwaukee, a municipal corporation in the County of Clackamas in the state of Oregon, do hereby proclaim September 22nd, December, September 2022 to be National Preparedness Month in the City of Milwaukee. Thank you for Thank coming. Thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate it. Have a good evening. Me too. <clears throat> All right, this is the part of the agenda during which council will hear community members' statements regarding city business. For those in person who wish to speak, please submit a yellow comment card found on the table just outside the door. If you're on Zoom, please use the raise hand reaction to alert staff who wish to speak and when instructed to begin. Click the microphone option to unmute yourself. If you are calling in through Zoom and would like to make a comment, dial star nine to raise your hand. You may also submit a comment via email to ocr at milwaukeeoregon.gov. Before you make your comments, please state your name and city of residence for the record. If you would like the city to follow up with you, please submit your contact information to ocr at milwaukeeoregon.gov. As council has other business items on the agenda this evening, speakers will be limited to three minutes each. Because information provided during community comments may be new, City manager will respond at the next council meeting to those comments that require follow-up. Before we begin, is there follow-up from the September 6th community comments? Ms. Over. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, there were two comments made at the meeting. The first was from uh, Paul Lysak, and he was asking about doing an anniversary proclamation. Staff's working on that discussion. We'll have more information by the next meeting. Uh, the second was with Pat Strauss, and it was a discussion about the um, code enforcement that's being done on, on the property at their house. I do believe, Mayor, that you've been in touch with her again, um, and I know that she's had additional uh, interactions, but that's all the information I have today. Okay, Thank you. thanks. Got anybody online, Scott? I see no emails, I see no yellow comment cards, and um, just staff and a presenter at, at, for a different topic on Zoom, so no Mr. Mayor. Okay, cool. Uh, tonight's consent agenda includes minutes of the City Council for August 9th, 2022, a study session, August 16th, 2022, a work session, August 16th, 2022, a regular session. It includes a resolution updating the legal description of the Harlow Road Public Street right-of-way vacated within Milwaukee Bay Park by resolution 59-2020. And includes a resolution acting as a local contract review board authorizing the purchase of three police vehicles. Does any member of council wish to remove an item from the consent agenda? No. I do, I wish to remove C, uh, have a conversation about that. Um, so I would entertain a motion to... I move to approve the items A and B on the consent agenda tonight. I'll second. Any further discussion? It's uh, has been moved and seconded to approve tonight's consent agenda uh, as minus item C. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None heard. Passes unanimously. Um, 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 Peter and I are going to try and address your questions okay. because the police department's not available. So, um, do you want to start, and then we'll we'll go from there? Sure. Um, of course, I left my notes. Would you like me to read them for you? Yes, please. <laughs> so the mayor had uh, sent an email earlier today just asking a couple of questions about why these vehicles. So the first question was, um, does the price include the outfitting? And I am not sure. We generally do all the outfitting in-house. I have not seen the staff report, so I don't know uh, what the what the price was on those. So but it, the, I think the staff the report was pretty everything? clear. We do, we do pretty much all of the outfitting of the police vehicles in-house. So but we, and, we purchased the equipment. Yeah. We, so that cost is included. Yeah. But we do the, yeah, we do that all. So every police vehicle that comes in that's new to the, to the city, our fleet team outfits it. So the reasoning that I've often been told for why not change vehicles is that it's less expensive to do the ones we're currently using because that 
They're prefabbed. It's prefabbed. So, some of the so pieces, everything else is customized. If you no, some of the pieces are prefabbed and they fit into the right. the design of the vehicle we have without modification. When we start going into the modification part, um, we saw this when we did the Tesla for the Chief. We actually had to. The, the lights are in different places than they would be on one of our other vehicles. So we had to do specialty installs on a bunch of those. Um, it worked, but it was, it's just more complicated and it means that you can't buy the off sh the shelf stuff. You have to do a little more customization. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the second question is which hybrids and EVs were considered? Um, I, Peter and I just talked about this. Do you want to talk a little bit about it? Yeah, we didn't, we haven't specifically considered any for these replacements right now, but I will share, you know, over the last several years, we have bought a, a hybrid uh, Chrysler Pacifica EV for the police department, uh, a Tesla, and we just bought, purchased a Mach-E for, for the department as well. So uh, those aren't patrol vehicles. You know, one of the things that we've found when we've when we've researched, you know, the different vehicles, EVs that are out there and trying to look at how we can outfit them. We talked a little bit about the customization, but the equipment that we're putting in there really makes it tough in terms of size and especially in the back seat of, of many of the vehicles. They're really sort of small in terms of how much space is available there to for uh, you know, to if if the police uh, have to pick somebody up, or if you know if we're using it for a dog, it's it's really sort of tough to tough to do. Uh, I do know that there are several models that are are in the mix in in F, you know 2024. They're saying that they are coming out with police uh, vehicles, EV vehicles. I think Dodge, uh, a char not a is it a Charger? Oh, One, really? There is a, there's an EV specifically that Which, they're making. What, what better name for an EV? <laughs> right? Yeah. I've been waiting for 50 years. It's like those, are, those are charger. charger. Yeah. Charger. So I think, I think they're coming out with that in 24. Uh, you know, we have found over the last, over this past uh, two years that, you know, the, uh, the EVs for, you know, light duty pickup trucks uh, are, are coming out on the market. There's a, a long uh, wait, wait time. We have to, we've, we've got one on order. One's being built for October for our public works department, uh, but they're, they're, it's hard to, it's hard to get one. Uh, you've got, you've got to wait. Uh, so, but we're always constantly looking and surveying and having discussions with the, you know, with opportunities with the police department on, on these types of vehicles. Your last one was just, did we calculate the price associated with gas when we're doing gas and these decisions? Yeah, gas, gas and, and maintenance. Non-accident non, non maintenance. I would say that a lot of our maintenance is accident related. So I'm gonna just be really transparent about that. So the, the savings are gonna be lower just because that's usually why we have a vehicle in. Um, in our police vehicles, they, they do get the most miles of any vehicles right, that we do have. Is, is so we, have, we, we do do that. I don't have that information available, but you know, Damien and, and Karen, our, our fleet and our fleet team, they, they track miles uh, for, for vehicles on how many, you know, how many miles we get a year. And, and we do the same thing with our EVs. How many miles are we putting on our EVs? So we do, we do track that uh, and, and can certainly convert that to what the expense would be for for gas over over the lifetime of that vehicle. But I don't have that with us right now. So am I remembering in the report that roughly we're planning to replace three a year for some period of time? Yeah, and this is an ongoing thing. The, the lifespan of these vehicles is just slower or lower uh, because we do put so many miles on them. So they, they will flip on a regular basis. Um, and as I think Peter said at the very beginning, the ones that do stay around longer um, have been transitioned to electric or to hybrid just because we can. They're, they're models that allow for it. So the Pacifica and the Tesla. And in, um, and, and in terms of charging infrastructure, uh, Damien is actually working on a project to install new charging infrastructure at, uh, at the public safety building uh, and our public works department, the library and the new city hall. So, and Johnson Creek as well. So 
But, but I will say the police department and Peter's team, all of us know that it is a priority and we are looking on a regular basis. I'd say I have a conversation at least three or four times a year with either the police chief or with Damien about where we're at and, and how the transition's going around our vehicle fleet. Yeah. I was just struck by how many miles we are seeing on these vehicles in four years and thinking about the you know, the climate impact of that many miles driven, particularly, you know, very often people's arguments for not switching to EV is, well, it's hard to charge on long distance trips. Well, we're not doing any long distance trips, right? Mm -hmm. They're all, it's all very localized. So it would be um, pretty simple to do, but um, hopefully over the next year, there will be more models come out that uh, the, the officers feel like would be appropriate to be yeah, and they're coming out with, you know, specifically designed models for, for police departments, for patrol vehicles and things like that, that didn't exist before. Yeah. I was just looking up the 2024 Dodge Charger. It sounds really awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 500 mile estimated range, wow. all sorts of cool stuff going on there. So I think it's gonna, it sounds like it's gonna hit the mark and probably be really exciting in addition to fulfilling the, necessary dry requirements that the police department needs to fulfill, so. Well, and I also just wanna make sure that um, before we get, I do love the new vehicle and I'm really excited about it, but uh, different officers do need different resources within the vehicle. So one style is not gonna actually meet the full demands of the department, but it would allow us to start turning some of them over. All right, Thanks. thank you, I appreciate it. We need we need a motion to uh, pass item C. I'll move to approve a resolution acting as the local contract review board authorizing the purchase of three police vehicles. I second. It's been moved and seconded uh, to pass a resolution uh, acting as the local contract review board authorizing the purchase of three police vehicles. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None heard, it passes unanimously. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, next item, council park goal, parks goal adoption resolution. And this is going to be presented by Councilor, President Heisey and Councilor Beatty. Presumably. But I just re realized we have a revised version and we haven't provided copies of that. So I wonder if we should move this to later in the meeting so that we can print copies of that for everybody yeah. at the break. Yeah, if you want to send me the the updated version, I'll go get copies now. I mean, is there, does that make sense to you? Are there revisions sure. since Friday? Not that I know of. Okay, so you already have. The okay, the Friday version? Yeah. Perfect. Sounds great. So, okay, so we are moving it to later in the meeting? Sure. Okay. In that case, uh, capital projects update, uh, which will be presented by our city engineer, Steve Adams, and assistant city engineer, Jennifer Garbley. Happy fall. Um, Steve Adams, city engineer, and? Jennifer Garley, assistant city engineer. And Jen will be handling a lot of this. I uh, watch over two of the capital projects. She handles the other 20. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the ones I have are Monroe Street Greenway. Uh, and that actually has some progress over the last quarter. Woohoo! Okay, so we've been working on trying to get an agreement with ODOT for about two years now, Kelly, something like that, it's a long time. Uh, so on the various segments, segment E is the one that we had the 3.9 million grant uh, from uh, the Metro, Metro Rafa Fund. 
we are actually, uh, we got word just yesterday from ODOT that they think we are noticed to proceed in advertising for requests for proposals from consultants. So yes. the person in charge is on vacation till the 23rd, so we should hear more uh, next week on what's going on. I'm on vacation next week, so Kelly will hear more next week. <laughs> Um, but we should be moving forward and hiring a uh, design consultant for that segment E. Uh, segment D, if you haven't been driven by there in a while, they actually have some of the sidewalk already poured. Uh, so they're working as they get their buildings built and then they'll come in at the end and probably pour the, uh, the 10 foot wide asphalt path, which is the bikes, but that is under construction right now. Uh, that segment D and that little piece of segment C as well, being done with the Monroe apartments. Uh, I'll skip over to the intersection of Highway 224 and Monroe. So design started on that in February. ODOT has a design team of 21, 22 people, which is unbelievable for an intersection, but that's what they work with. Um, and then we wonder why everything's so expensive. Yeah, so it's kind of weird. I'm 21 of them and one of me in the meeting. I'm the only city person at these meetings. So it's kind of an interesting mix. Uh, but they've been moving right, right along. Survey is done. They tell me they anticipate having a set of plans for city review by the end of this year. Uh, and so that is progressing. Interesting news that I got from ODA that it, I did not know before. They hope to combine their intersection improvements. It includes a lot of paving. They're, they're, talking about paving from Oak Street all the way up to Harrison and just repaving all that when they do it. They've now extended that and they have a paving project in the works from Rusk Road to 17th. And the project manager for this intersection emailed me and said that he they plan to coordinate the two projects so they get the same construction crew and just get all the paving and everything done at the same time. So it'll be quite the impact on Milwaukee. Imagine when you're paving that length of road it's 100 percent kind of with surrounded by the city of milwaukee but it'll be done at the same time the actual uh signal changes are done making that a bike ped crossing i don't know the dates yet either say they're coordinating is, what level of pavement this isn't like a grind replace it, it's, it's a, a grind and replace it's probably a two inch grind and replacement just to take care of the the older asphalt that's been there it's cracking and whatnot i imagine that's all all they're doing he didn't indicate anything more than that um, as far as uh, the transitions into that intersection, that's about 1.55 million that uh, they are working on writing an IGA for us. They anticipate some uh, uh, us to be able to review the IGA by early 2023. So that again is, is moving along too. Uh, I can't do much with that until I actually see the design that ODOT settles for, because that's what then we hand to our consultant and say, hey, match up to this. So I think we're fine as far as timing, seeing the IGA in uh, in early 2023. So that's from 29th, is that what I'm seeing, to Oak? Is that what? 29th to Campbell or Oak, depending on how far we can take the 1.55 million. Yeah, so we, we want to tie in as much as we can. Uh, Kelly is working on getting the the blanks so there's a, the the blank on oak mm -hmm. from one intersection to campbell okay. uh i think kelly is looking for urban renewal funding but she might be able to fill you in more on that herself uh is that crossing the train tracks you mean? yes it is yeah the train tracks that just have a brand new crossing put in a couple of weeks ago actually all three crossings have been well, not all three three harrison got, got done last th thursday friday wednesday thursday from my with that and harmony was rebuilt uh saturday sunday and monday morning they were 12 hours late in getting their road done but the harmony one we just finished just uh yesterday that one was in desperate need yeah yeah uh, and that's where we're at on Monroe Greenway. Any questions? Did they yeah. happen to take into account that we were doing this when they did that on Oak? No, I did. I did talk. I did talk to some of their staff. I said, you know, we do have a a go. Greenway plan coming where we want to put about a ten foot wide crossing on this, you know, and uh, I'm thinking it's going to be on the the west side of Oak, but we don't really know yet. But no, this, they only did the crossing and we have to come back and we'll have to work with them again when we do the wider crossing that we need. 
That'll be lots of fun. Yes, yes it will be. I'm looking forward to it. I can <laughs> Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Interesting about repaving. So they're repaving pretty much everything in Milwaukee. Or on 224. 24. That's what the email said I got last week. And they're putting in new signals. So 224 is really getting the major upgrade this year. It looks yeah. like it, yes. It's, well, they're working on design, so it's probably another year, year and a half out before construction. Oh, okay. Maybe so, two or three. I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. know how far out. Time-wise, it's going to take a little time to get there, but they're saying they're, they're going to do it, so that's okay. great. Okay. Yeah. So are we going to hear about from 29th to the tri-trail later this evening? Is that the... We have no money for that. There is no money uh, until money is found. That's just kind of sitting there. I, I know that Oak Street is, is a pretty important segment and Kelly's working on that, but I do not know if there's any funds for 29 down to the trolley trail. Okay. Okay. Next. Uh, okay, Homewood. Yes, this has been a real interesting project to manage this summer. Uh, we take some steps forward, we take some steps backwards. Uh, Kerr has been one of the more challenging construction companies to work, work with. Uh, they have for all three projects I've worked with them over the last dozen years. But we are making some progress. Uh, we actually have most of the curb on home installed right now. Uh, wood was paved base paved in uh, early august and so it's been cement amended base paved it's been ready to be top lifted for uh five or six weeks now six weeks now uh home avenue was cement treated uh, a few weeks ago and they've been working on, on putting all the curb getting the curb ready so you just pave up against the uh, curb and gutter so most of that we're at a 90 95 percent 90% of the curb is in that's gonna, gonna be, be installed. Um, they got a little more curb work they're gonna work on Thursday. Next week is paving week. So next week, Monday, Tuesday, they put the base lift on wood, uh, south half first, home, sorry about that, thank you. Uh, railroad to about, uh, is it Dick Lane? Uh, Dick Avenue is the base lift on Monday, base lift on Tuesday is from Dick all the way up to uh, King. Then they come back on Wednesday and they can top lift the whole thing in one day. So it'd be top lifted on Wednesday. Thursday, we go over to wood and we top lift wood. We take care of all of wood on Thursday. Friday, they come back over to home and they do the asphalt driveway connections from the new street to the private driveways. And that'll be, They've said one day, it might be a very long day, so we'll have to have staff ready to go into the evening. Uh, I'm on vacation next week, so Jen's aware of this. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but we, we will have it all paved, and then October pretty much is form and install side, the sidewalk on the west side of home, and that'll be probably a good chunk of October. Hopefully they get it done there by the end of October, but it'll be a lot of sidewalk pouring in, in that zone. But at least the street will be paved so people won't have the dust and won't have the, you know, the issues at hand. Um, but no, it's actually uh, coming along pretty good right now. And are we using the, um, the pavement that you used on Lake? Is that now no. our? No, we're, we're not. not. No, this, this, is, this is just regular, in, um, uh, impervious asphalt. Uh, you need enough traffic, enough higher speed that the leaves get blown off the road. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know wood doesn't have the traffic counts and so the, it would tend to get ground up in it. Uh, home, uh, questionable. The, the speeds aren't really high. We are putting in four or five speed cushions on home. It has three on there right now, so we're putting in five more to reduce speeds. And, and if, um, on the south end, we did narrow the street down to 21 feet so that traffic coming and going uh, visually, it will look narrow. There's gonna be a yellow stripe in that south 200 feet, but we want cars to enter and leave the neighborhood on a, knowing they're in a neighborhood and not speeding. Speeding on that south end was one of the common complaints that we've heard, so we, we narrowed that down. Um, and up at up at Dick to 
accommodate for the huge fir trees on the east side of the road. We shifted the whole road to the west about five or six feet. So as you come up the street, you'll actually jog to the west a little bit, then jog back. And that jog will also help to slow traffic down. Uh, in the north end, uh, where we are adding curb, we're again at about a 21 foot asphalt width as we approach King Road. So again, we're trying to keep cars to go at a more moderate speed down down home with the uh, placement of curb and uh, the width of the uh, the asphalt. Any any other questions? And I, I give it to Jen. All right, let's talk about Meek North Face. So we received actual permission and approval from the engineering department at the railroad. It was very exciting. Um, I've got an agreement right now. Um, there's a couple amendments I wanted to it um, when they sent the original one over, um, but we're getting close um, with that. It's got a closing date of January, 2023. Um, once we get that closing date um, and everything goes and we have the actual property, then I can go out for construction. So that project is fully designed and ready to go. So we don't have a whole lot of wait time once we get that process moving forward. So we're working on that agreement. I'll be back for an actual um, payment authorization to purchase the property and the pipeline easement um, that goes from the north side of the um, pond to connect into a Roswell station. So that's exciting and moving forward. What do you think finally got the railroad? Did what? What do you think finally got the railroad? <laughs> they um, actually reduced um, our footprint. It'll save us some money, um, but they wanted a um, 50 foot right away through the area instead of a 30 foot right away. So we basically took off 20 feet, um, pushed the pond a little bit further uh, east a little bit, kind of redesigned it slightly um, to handle that. Um, and just means we just have a little less room to move around in that area. Um, but that's what that's what ultimately they said, okay, they turned over a lot of staff people. So that was the hard part is it was like, uh, another person started, you know, a new person. So then they had to go through the review process again. And, um, but finally they did approve it. And that's, so it will be a reduce from when we originally, um, I think we're gonna purchase the property for over 800. Now we're closer to 600. Um, so there was a significant um, drop in the price, which is great, um, and we can we'll make that work. Did you so. get any sense during all that back and forth thing that they are looking towards double tracking through there? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. No, that's the number one reason. Can they? Uh, yeah, the fifty foot is actually more for a triple track in a sense, which I don't see how they could possibly get through there. But that's them. Um, no, they've always they yeah, a double track is definitely something they're considering. Yeah. So correct. We just have to keep that in our heads as we're doing our TSP. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So. All right, let's move on to forty second, forty third, safe improvements. We are gonna wrap up this month. We are gonna be done. It's gonna be completely done and complete, which is absolutely exciting. Um, super happy with Tappany. They came in and basically busted it out in like seven months. Um, so really impressed and super exciting. We are gonna have a party. It'll be in October or early November. I don't quite have the details yet. We're still working that out, but you'll be invited. Will there be Shero decorated donuts available at this time? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure about that, but let me see what we, we plant can plant some seeds here. <laughs> let me see what we can do. Um, yeah, so there right. Shero's through the whole thing? No. There is Shero's on the um, 42nd. The, um, east side lane. I'm going north because we only have a uh, 10 foot multi path on one side. So there is sharrows that come down. There's sharrows on Howell and then 42nd okay. all the way to Johnson Creek because that is the bike route, okay. which is identified in the current um, TSB. Oh. Yeah. So yeah. I was admiring them the last time I was down there. I was like, this is this is a very high sharrow density area. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen the Sharrows on 29th? I have, yes. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. If Jacob Sherman is watching, I admired those as well. <laughs> so yeah, so there's one of our nice completions and we're quite excited about. Um, so next, where well, we're at right now, Ardenwald North Improvements is being designed in-house. Um, we're just about at a 60%, um, still moving with that shared roadway concept. Um, so moving along, we um, are getting closer and we'll not exactly sure we're gonna get it out, kind of depends on money, but um, I, we're getting close on our bond. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Washington Area Improvements. So this is a project that is outsourced um, to AKS. They are just submitting their 60%. So they are also moving pretty quick though and getting things ready. Um, this is a pretty good size project. We're looking right now about five, almost 6 million. Only thing I'm worried about right now is construction pricing. Um, so. When we decide to go out to bid, that'll be the biggest concern at the moment. So what do we have upcoming? We have Harvey Street Improvements. Um, we are gonna outsource this project um, to a consultant. I lost a civil engineer and kind of down, haven't found a replacement. Um, so it made sense to, we should actually send this out um, to keep moving things forward. So we're hoping to go out um, with a fall RFQ then we have our wastewater improvements from 2021. Uh, Brandon is designing those right now. Um, it is actually getting super close um, and we plan to definitely send that out in winter for construction. It's got several small segments and I do not remember all the segments. I might've put that in the well, Waverly Heights report. are part of it, right? That's separate. Okay. So King Road improvements, um, we're prepping to go out for a design this fall as well. Um, it's another $5 million, $6 million project. Large things come into Milwaukee. And then we have Waverly Heights sewer improvements. And that has been one of our sewer projects that has been in the master plan for over 20 years. And no one's really wanted to take it on. It's now time we actually needed to do it. <laughs> Um, so anyways, it's out for a winter RFQ and we are hoping to actually get some funding through West through their I and I program, maybe even up to a million dollars. Isn't that our last clay pipe? It's our last of our clay pipe. You're correct. Um, so it's a, it's a, we don't need to upsize it, but it's got a lot of I and I. It's in the back of the million dollar homes yeah. in so you, Waverly Heights. going to do pipe bursting? I'm hoping. <laughs> I'm hoping, I'm hoping to do some pipe bursting. Um, I'm a little worried how shallow the pipe is. We may actually have some issues with that, but we'll see. Like it, it wasn't done to code or it wasn't done to current code when it was done or what? Um, you, when you pipe burst, if it's not deep enough, you may impact things that are above it. So we may have to actually come through and actually line it instead. Um, so we're gonna get a designer to help us look at that project just cause it's pretty intense and wanna make sure we're doing it right How, the first time. So if you don't pipe burst, you line it, meaning you shoot something in it that forms a liner? Possibly. You don't dig it up and relay it. That's another possibility. <laughs> <laughs> The ones you least wants and to how do you that's the more expensive option how do you determine how do you test out whether pipe bursting is going to work i'll get a, i'll get an actual um you know someone that has a lot of experience and let them look at it and see if they can if this if they're like no this is too much risk we yeah. can't do that yeah. i'll get a geotech on board too to really look at the soils and kind of what what options do we have and will it necessarily do the same through the whole length of the pro project, or it might be some segments? You I think can we're going to have a burst, and some segments you can't. Or I think we're going to have a little combination of things. Yeah. As far as that goes, and that's why I really want another set of eyes looking at it to say, "Hey, this is this is what we got. How can we actually fit this in and do it efficiently and cost effectively?" Yeah. So. With that, we do have some concerns. Um, our bond is pretty much done. Um, we've got um, 
with everything that we've done and what's right now been obligated, about $600,000 left over. So um, the other issue that we are starting to look at is construction costs. We're hearing it, it's increasing. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, I've worked really hard to definitely put out packages at good times, give contractors a good amount of time to do the work, which has helped us significantly keep those costs down. So we'll see how that you know continues. I obviously, we're not in this like super rush that we have to have things done tomorrow, but we could still see some increases. We could still see that come. Is it is it materials and supply chain or is it labor? Labor. We, it's everything. All of the above. It's all of the above. Pipe is definitely going up. Um, I've, um, it's also harder to get, but if I have some good links in there, they may be able to keep the price down. Um, but I have heard ductile iron's gone up, PVC has gone up. Um, and just in general, like, costs have gone up. Um, so that's, it, it, you know, that's one of my worry spots. Um, cause we got a lot of work and a lot of things to do. So I'm putting it out there and we're just so you're aware yeah. <laughs> that it could hit. So as far as the bond goes, um, right now I'm sitting at a point where I feel I can get Ardenwald North when it's ready to go out for construction, that I could actually award that and move it forward. Um, with everything that's obligated, um, I still have a little bit of fluff in there that I'm that I think we might have some savings. 42nd, 43rd is looking great. I think there's gonna be some money off of there are gonna be able to hand towards it. What comes in next is we're gonna have Washington area improvements fully designed and that's part of the obligation, so that's not a problem, but I'm not gonna have enough funds to actually go out for construction when it's ready. So that's my next project that I would want to go because if we have a full design, we don't want that to sit on the shelf too long if we don't have to, um, as far as that goes. But then we come into King and Harvey. And like right now, I may have to delay the RFP if we're not gonna bond. So really that's kind of the next step is, you know, when are we gonna bond? Cause it basically, there's no point of me going out for an RFQ if I'm delayed six, a year, I don't know how long. Um, but that's kind of the next topic and Kelly, do you want to jump in at this time, or we? Let me keep going. Keep going. Later. Well, this is all I got. Am <laughs> <laughs> I supposed to talk He's about like, more? I need money. Go. I don't know. Do you want to talk more? <laughs> I mean, I was about to ask a question that was going to summon you up here anyway, Kelly. Okay. So. That's what I love. The question was just going to be, and you can already anticipate it. It, it seems like King Road is big enough and expensive enough that federalizing it is is maybe on the table? Is there any anything that you've seen come out of the bipartisan infrastructure bill in terms of dollars that might be able to go toward that or any rumblings at the state level? Um, so King is definitely a good candidate for grants. We've talked about it more on safe routes again to try to go back similar to kind of what we did a scale more like so state funds, not federal funds. Um, but it's definitely eligible. I don't think that gets us out of the bonding topic, just so you know, but definitely it is one that is large enough. And we actually, I mean, Jen and I have had meetings with consultants about it. It's, it's big enough where people get excited. I think we'd have a lot of different firms that would be interested in getting involved in that one, given Milwaukee's reputation and the size of that project. So um, mm -hmm. in terms of bonding, what's gonna happen later as I come back is um, Milwaukee Redevelopment Commission. And I was gonna talk more kind of in the broader context there about as much as I can tell you today about rates and timing and things like that and just get a sense of you there. But just, I think the main thing I need for you to know in this part of the agenda is the two things are combined. So if we're going to bond, we would do the infrastructure for our transportation related funds, SAFE, SSMP, gas tax. And we would also do the urban renewal infrastructure projects at the same time. So I think the thing to think about um, for the purposes of this conversation is you won't know a lot tonight and other than interest rates are going up. 
right? It's not the world's greatest lending environment. Um, they have they have been going up. They're not terribly different than they were in 2018. To be honest, in the 20 year time frame and the 30 year time frame, they are different. Um, so um, I think what we're looking for tonight is just sort of. This is always assumed. We always knew that we would need to go back out for debt as a part of this adopted budget. We pointed to it in the budget document. So we've tried to be transparent that we would need to, on the transportation and you and urban renewal side, need to, to do this again. Um, we weren't really sure if we'd need to do it in the fall or the spring. Um, and I think what you're hearing Jen say is you still have some flexibility on when you want to do it, but she's trying to point you towards what would slow, what would slow down if you don't do it now versus if you tried to wait for a more favorable um, interest environment. And so, yeah, so I don't know how much further to go because I'm not officially telling you this on behalf of the Urban Renewal District right now, um, but it's all the same conversation. Um, how much do you want to do now versus are there things that you might want to slow down? I think what's probably gonna make the most sense when we're all done with this is some scenarios that we come back to you with on the 15th when I can actually show you like, okay, if you do $15 million worth of projects, it looks like this. If you do 20, it looks like this. If you do 25, it looks like that. And is this, what's our comfort level? Which way do you wanna go with the, and then if you're comfortable with that, then we would do that by the end of this year. You'd vote on it, you'd tell us what to do, we'd enter into the agreement and we'd move forward um, and we would issue that debt closing out 2022. Or everyone could say, eh, this feels weird. We'd like to wait and then we would go and do it more in 2023. Um, but there are projects that slow down. So I think that's what we're trying to tell you tonight is just so you can start getting a sense of what projects go no matter what, what projects slow down. Um, for the URA part of the meeting, they all slow down. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, you know, but for SAFE, it's a little, and SSMP, it's a little more complicated. Yeah. So I guess the mayor and I were the only ones on council when we did the first bonding, because I remember it's true. Councilor Abma being here, so that meant yeah. the council mm -hmm. president wasn't on council yet either. Yeah. So when we did that, we had a lot of discussion about, uh, you know, bonding and what it cost even back then under much better rates. and. Um, you know, trying to do it, you know, we had this very ambitious nine year line. We obviously aren't on a nine year line anymore. So it'd be helpful yeah. to, when you do come back to kind of lay out where we are on that line, um, how many years we're looking at now at the different points you, um, price points you I would back. love to do that. <laughs> I think, <laughs> um, I think what we can do, so part of what we've done to get to this point, Jen did a really good job of walking through all the projects and the way that we've bundled things together, we've actually made really substantial prog progress through most of the tier one priorities and we're now getting into the tier twos. I think um, we I could probably answer that question, assuming we were gonna stay with the, the project list that we have in the bike pad advisory plan, but we're about to embark upon a TSP. <laughs> so I think it's mm -hmm. it's a little, yeah. I don't know entirely. I can I could probably give you a sense of like, we've checked these, I've got my map that we've been using for the nine years and I can check, mm -hmm. check, 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 yeah. check, check, and show you which ones are checked and which ones are left. Um, that way we could do that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think that would give you a sense of what that conversation was then versus what it is today. But we've actually, God, we've done a lot of them. They just have been bundled into single projects. Like all these little segments actually got pulled into bigger projects. projects. Yeah. King Road was one that was a tier one, but we yeah. pushed that one, but we moved other things up to keep moving things forward. Yeah. So. Um, but I don't know if that will get at what you want. Well, it, no. it would be useful just to, even if we use the current CIP list yeah. and just went mm -hmm. through it that way, knowing that, I mean, that would help inform the future council when they are thinking mm -hmm. about the TSP. Do we want to stick to this list? Are there things we want to flip? You know, um, are there new things that the TSP has arrived at that we need to add in? All of that, but. We won't know the TSP though stuff until next, right. yeah, but just Yeah, so we're gonna have to, obviously, we're gonna have to bond before we know the TSP. So that's why I'm saying, let's start with what we're, our current plan. Right, yeah, I think we're, the universe we're operating in right now is just to be on the adopted projects that you all adopted as a part of this biennium budget. 
-hmm. that, and we did assume debt financing as a part. We knew we would, we knew we'd run out sometime in this budget. And so we're now at that place. And these are the ones in this adopted budget that will slow down or be delayed um, if we don't issue the debt now. And I've calculated out for 23, 24, and 25 projects. That's what I'm at. That's, okay. that's what I'd be looking at for the bond. Yeah. Which is 22 million. Yeah. Yeah. I, so is that getting at you? Councilor Bailey, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but. And it's, you know, okay. nobody has a crystal ball, but I'd be really surprised if interest rates dropped a whole lot by that. Yeah. Three years. Right. I don't, yeah. They might fluctuate a point or. I don't know. And that's where on the 15th, I'll have bond council. Yeah. So the, 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 the goal of the next conversation, again, we're running out of months in the year, unfortunately, but um, I would have the bond council here to kind of look at, okay, these are the projects that if you did it at this amount, you would hit based on the adopted plans we have today, not the future plans, but this mm -hmm. amount of money, this many projects over this many years at this rate, and this is the financial impact. We can walk through those scenarios and, and see what you're comfortable with, right? I won't be able to... The, the more programmatic update uh, is more what we did back when we talked through SAFE and SSMP a couple months ago. We're like, this is our SAFE program overall. This is what we've worked our way through. This is what's left. And these are kind of the big issues that we're facing. That, that was more that report, which I can go back and take a fresh look at and see what's changed since we gave it to you a few months ago and, and kind of provide that level of an update on the program. Um, that I, could, I could definitely do that. That. I mean, I do think we need a range of, yeah, a couple, you know, mm -hmm. of, a range of options in terms of how much we're going to borrow. I do think we need. Yeah, we, I, I really do want to be absolutely transparent with you all. I mean, this, um, we have, we can show you the project impacts, and I also don't want to, um, I don't want to pretend like this is the perfect time to. Mm -hmm. Last year Take was out, the perfect right. time. Right. So I mean, it's you know, it's but we've been trying to trying to be really judicious. We actually spent down slower than we expected to on the first bond, um, and I think for a lot of good reasons. To be honest, um, we found we applied for grant money. We've found other sources of money. We've done things that I think have been part of what we were asked to do, which was don't take out debt. You don't need to. <laughs> so we've been trying not to take out debt. We don't need to, um, but we're finally here. Uh, so. That, yeah, I think as long as you all are comfortable with some options and then associated project lists, mm -hmm. then I think that's what you would get next. Okay. I also just want to make sure everyone knows that's pretty much Kelly's whole presentation today in the urban <laughs> renewal, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. which is totally fine. Yeah. But I think we're probably going to be pretty short at the end of the meeting. So okay. <laughs> we've got to do an appointment and she'll say like two minutes, but I think that's about it. Yeah, I just want you to see what those projects are over there so you can be thinking that through as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. good. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Great report. Great work <laughs> thus far. I mean, it's, it's awesome. Oh, the, pro yeah, people, the projects are awesome. People yeah. are and noticing. And everybody loves them. Yeah. Like, not just in Milwaukee. I mean, people are noticing much broader, and they're impressed. So good work. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Shero Donuts. <laughs> Did you know that was Councillor Falconer's daughter in that picture in Ardenwald? I thought she looked awful. No. No, was yeah. it? Where? <laughs> yeah. It was what? a little version. <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Okay, so let's see, where are we? Public, uh, climate fee policy. Oh, you want to do this now? Why don't we do this and then should we take 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 let's take a five minute break so then we can read it oh. all right we're, we're gonna take we're gonna take a five minute break and so we will be back in five minutes gives us an opportunity to read this and do whatever else
All right, uh, welcome back. Our next item will be the Council Parks Goal Adoption Resolution presented by Councilor Beatty and Council President Heisey. <laughs> we didn't plan this either. Um, <laughs> There's not a whole lot to say here. Uh, there was a version of the resolution in the packet and uh, the one that we are presenting today is very, has very tiny changes to it, um, but we can, I suppose we have to read it into the record anyway. Should we just read it? Do we have to read it or can it just be supplanted in the packet tomorrow by you? The parts that have been revised from what was in the packet should be read into the, the whole thing does not, but the parts that are changed should be. Okay. And this was discussed at the last uh, council meeting mm -hmm. or at the study session. I can't even remember <laughs> whether it's a regular meeting or a study session. We discussed it recently. Yes. At a different meeting. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to say anything else? Should I? I think we only have to read from the be it further resolves, right? The two. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to read the first half of the. Yeah, I don't think there's anything. I mean, to add other than what we said before, which was that, um, you know, cal uh, council discussed parks as a potential goal last year. Uh, the landscape has changed and it's made it more compelling uh, and important to uh, raise parks, resolving our, such our management of parks to a council goal. So the revision to the resolution, as you go down, there's the three whereases, then there's a therefore, then there's a be it further resolved. And under the be it further resolved, there are three bullet points. After the third one, which is a very long one, we've inserted be it further resolved that through this goal, the city council commits to the following actions prioritizing funding to ensure the completion of parks projects, considering placing a parks related measure on the ballot in the spring of 2023 and conducting outreach to keep residents of Milwaukee informed of the process and issues moving forward. That was the change was primarily just the insertion of that, um, be it further resolved, clarifying that those are actions that the city council will be doing, not just the city. And this follows the format of our equity, justice and inclusion goal, as we sort of had a similar breakout of responsibilities. Any comments, questions from anyone? <coughs> When, if, when, if motion is made, just add as amended to the end of what's in the script. Okay. If there's, are you going to, moving? What, what did you want me to add at the end of it? As amended. As amended, okay. I move to approve the resolution adopting council goals for the remainder of 2022 and the start of 2023 as amended. All second. It has been moved and seconded to approve the resolution adopting council goals for the remainder of 2022 and the start of 2023. Is there any further discussion? I think it would be maybe worthwhile for people that were not watching whichever meeting that was that we discussed this at before to help them understand why mid-cycle were, I mean, a little more, you kind of did, but why mid-cycle were adding a council goal. Okay, we can do that. I mean, uh, it, we explained that in the, the resolution portion that we didn't read, but effectively we were pointing to the part where um, we've been having extensive discussions over the past several months about our relationship with North Clackamas Parks and Recreation District and the challenges we're having in getting our parks built in Milwaukee and looking at the um, influx of new units. We have 1500 new units of housing coming, which is terrific. We sorely need housing in the region and the country, frankly. Um, and so we welcome that development, but it does mean that we need to also be able to provide the services for those folks. The majority of those units are going to be apartments and um, it 
is uh, it's going to be really hard for us to ensure that we are getting the park services we need in proximity to the places where we need them um, if we aren't the people who are controlling our parks. So that's that's kind of a nutshell summary. And I, I would say to the extent people want feel like they need more background than that. And there is a lot of background. There's an extensive so list of, of reasons that have gone into this. Um, tune into your, uh, participate in your neighborhood district association meeting in October. Some of us will be there at all. Someone will be at all of the neighborhood district associations to talk about this. There will be other public meeting opportunities to talk about this. There will be a website. There will be some informational cards at the farmer's market, at the city's booth, at the farmer's market. So just tune in in October uh, where there will be sort of more information that'll maybe be more coherent than we're being tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more to follow, a lot more to follow. Yeah, I would, I guess, be slightly more pointed about the reason, you know, North Clackamas Parks District is run by the county commissioners and it's been a fraught relationship at best at times. And, um, it's abundantly apparent that they have little to no intention to build out to parks, uh, specifically Milwaukee Bay Park that they've committed to quite some time ago. Um, and if we hope to see that park built or finished, um, it's going to be on us to do it. And, you know, we entered into that parks, we started that parks district several years ago. Um, and despite having been involved in starting it and with the understanding that they would, we would own our parks, but they would build them, we've actually built more of our parks than they have. Yeah, I think they've built th three, right? Of all well, of in parks. the last, I don't, I don't know, I, I can't speak for all the way back, but certainly in the last 20 years, they've built three. Yeah, so. And, and that was, you know, there, there have been good commissions and there was better work that was occurring, but it's um, gone pretty dramatically downhill. So this is the city looking to do what it did for a century before it helped form that parks district. If that helps. All right. Is there any further, further discussion? <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None heard. Great. Passes unanimously. All right. Um, we are on climate feed policy. Hi there. You can do this much faster than I can. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Council. My name is Natalie Rogers. I'm the Climate and Natural Resources Manager for the City of Milwaukee. I'm joined today by Todd Chase from FCS Group. Uh, they are helping us in this conversation to explore different revenue opportunities and strategies for a proposed climate fund, which uh, today my goal is to give you an overview of what this climate fund could help us um, either uh, continue, support, or expand in programming and opportunities here in Milwaukee around uh, our climate work. Um, and then we are going to kind of give you a brief timeline. Oh, sorry. Or, 
We're going to give you a brief timeline of just kind of what we are thinking around um, both outreach, uh, engagement, and implementation of, or I would say adoption around a, a potential climate fund. And uh, Todd and uh, we have Martin uh, Chaw on the line actually from FCS Group as well. So um, they are here to help essentially with the conversation around how a funding strategy was created. And based on the conversation that we had with council previously, where there were different changes that you wanted to um, potentially some of the, the different fee collection uh, strategies uh, to kind of show what they did. So with that, um, I'm going to, or actually maybe Todd, if you want to introduce yourself on what FCS Group does. Yes, thank you for including us tonight. Uh, Todd Chase, I'm an economist with FCS Group and we're focused on funding strategies for various types of services, government services, all types of utilities. And we have offices in Oregon, Washington, and Colorado. Great. So as mentioned, um, pretty much we're just gonna start off. So a lot of the information I'm gonna breeze through, uh, this was information that we prepared for a couple weeks ago for the, um, I think it was September 6th uh, council session, which I can't believe it's towards the end of September. Um, so just to make sure that we have plenty of time for discussion, I'm just gonna overview some of those slides. Um, but if there's questions, feel free to throw up a hand. I know I talk pretty fast sometimes, so uh, flag me down and I'll, I'll try to slow. Um, I'm also gonna, show you just a, a draft outreach timeline. Um, and then we're going to really enter more into the fee discussion around the details of the fee and what funding kind of goal we wanna to look towards uh, and then really enter into more of a council discussion. So um, really, I just wanted to remind folks of kind of the where the origin of the climate goal came from and the, the climate action plan expectations that were drafted through that goal. So in 2017, um, through our visioning process in the city, that's where kind of we start seeing the birth of some of the sustainability work, uh, or at least reference to sustainability in our um, plans looking forward. In 2018, the climate goal was adopted as a council goal that essentially kicked off our climate action plan creation. Um, it actually was led to me being hired here at the city as the climate uh, action and sustainability coordinator. Um, and then I was hired to essentially implement the actions that were outlined in the climate action plan, which was a community engaged process uh, to develop. Um, in the climate action plan, it is not a, um, a small list of things that we hope to accomplish. And there's some really cool programs in there that we've actually been checking off some boxes, which is cool. Um, there's 53 strategic actions that are listed in the climate action plan. We call these city led actions because it's supposed to be initiated, driven or supported uh, or promoted by the city itself. Um, some actions I do like to comment are actually a, a whole list of sub actions because for example, example, one action is um, expand our urban canopy to 40% canopy coverage by 2040. There's plenty of programs and actions that we can go down to a, a variety of granular depths on to, to accomplish that goal. Um, but I think that a lot of those are really important. Uh, same with a lot of the other climate actions that are in our action plan. And so we kind of prioritize as we go along. Um, there's also additional community outreach education that we do as a team. Um, and originally we started with just me, one FTE. And to this day, I think we about have a sustainability budget of about 50,000. And that goes towards supporting community organizations that are doing climate work, such as our home energy score, low income assistance program. Um, it also goes towards things like our greenhouse gas um, uh, inventory, which was uh, recently accomplished and I'm, um, you should be seeing a lot of that data coming out at the end of this year with our update. So I just wanted to cover um, some of the learnings from the years as a council goal, because our climate program is really a still a council goal program. Um, so we did see over the last, we'll say five years, a dramatic increase in movement and opportunities, conversations, legislation around climate. And there's a lot of communities that are entering the game when it comes to talking about climate and climate action in particular. Um, Milwaukee filled the need for a small community role model uh, for climate action. A lot of the work when I started was coming from Portland. Uh, they do great work, but it's also at a very different scale. And I think that there was this um, 
you know, notion that it couldn't be replicated at a small city scale. And I think one kind of um, purpose that our team has served is showing that it can be actually done at pretty much any jurisdictional level or modified to fit a certain just jurisdictional level. Um, our climate goals pretty much overlaps with a bunch of different existing projects, programs, and departments here in Milwaukee. A lot of the work that we're doing around transportation for our SAFE program is related to alternative transportation, which as we all know is an emissions reductor because you actually can walk, you can bike. Um, we have things around environmental justice and equity that is already being done here at the city. We have things around adaptation, resiliency, all of these are, are kind of highlighted in our climate action plan through different programs, but they align and dovetail really well with existing programs uh, when it comes to kind of climate as an overall topic at the city. Um, one thing that um, you know we have noticed is that pretty much with my time as kind of doing these implementation of programs and projects is there's definitely a level that gets hit and we've pretty much reached that limit in terms of what we can accomplish in terms of, of programs and incentives and essentially the time and resources it takes to offer up a program. And that's fine. Uh, it's just kind of knowing that capacity. And I know Anne, Peter, and pretty much all the leadership here in Milwaukee works really hard just to manage that capacity to make sure that we're accomplishing what we can without overextending ourselves. So knowing that limit is good. And I think right now, just in the work that we're doing, we've probably hit that limit with our current expectations around budget and how we kind of support ourselves. Um, and I know, you know, council, one of the reasons why we're here is because uh, for 2022, we got the direction to figure out how do we fund our climate work besides through a council goal fund. And so this is part of that conversation of knowing what our capacity is. And then one thing that um, I've started to lean into at the city and some of the work, how it's overlapping is in our natural resources team. So that's in, still in our public works department, um, but our natural resources team really was taking over things like our urban forestry work. Uh, as that program is also expanding here in Milwaukee, I mean, our urban forestry program really only started in 2017 as well. So both pretty new, but when we're looking kind of at this overlap of kind of the work being performed, Natural resources work, particularly trees, are one of the best things a small community can do to both sequester carbon, mitigate carbon emissions, and actually adapt for climate change. So it makes sense that we're trying to figure out what's the best bang for our buck. And natural resources kind of ended up being a great opportunity for that. Natural resources also are, I really like them as a climate action because they're highly visible projects and something that there's a lot of community interest in. Um, things like tree planting tends to, um, you know, bring an instant gratification when you're looking at a street or a park or a program. Um, some of the other kind of energy policy work is, is, I would say, you know, particularly as we're looking at our emissions sectors, very impactful, but it's also kind of hidden and it's part of the storytelling we need to talk about. Um, but tree planting and other natural resources is that high visibility for, for kind of some of the work that we're doing. And just to, I'm not gonna go in detail and I I'm, I'm, can share this out just cause I know it's a lot and I don't want you to cross your eyes looking at those neon colors on the screen. Um, but I just wanted to kind of show you in more of a diagram where kind of the intersection of some of our urban forest programming, our climate work and our stormwater work fit. Um, urban forest and stormwater go hand in hand. A lot of the work that our stormwater division um, does, and that's actually where our urban forestry program is funded currently, um, is essentially around green infrastructure. And we've been having that conversation as a community actually as a state, even with our stormwater permitting to really promote green infrastructure. Um, but you know, when we're talking about this climate fund and some of the options we'll present to you, one of the put, uh, potentials is to actually pull our urban forest program and fund it through a climate fund. And there's uh, pros and cons for this. A big pro is that you know, for our stormwater utility dollars, there's a lot of requirements around how we spend those, particularly when it comes to public versus private lands. Um, we've had some situations where it's kind of a, okay, well, if we wanted to do 
you know, a tree preservation act on private land using public stormwater dollars, that starts to get a little bit tricky. And so um, that would be one benefit of kind of how we shift around these programs for different funding sources. Um, so you'll see that in what I'll present to you in some of these options in a little bit later. Um, but I also just wanted to show this so the community can see kind of how our urban forest program fits into our existing stormwater utility, but then also our kind of newer climate work as a whole and um, just kind of the overlap on why we would consider pairing both urban forestry and climate action, both you know being climate benefits, wildlife benefits, habitat benefits, and big ad, uh, adaptation benefits for the community, but also how urban forestry can fit within stormwater utilities as well. Are there any questions on that in particular before I kind of move on? I just wanna make sure we have lots of time to cover the numbers, which is the fun part. Once again, a whole lot of words. Don't worry about reading them. I kind of tried to, I whipped up a little graphic on the right there just so it looks a little bit prettier and less, um, you know, brain intensive at eight o'clock. So um, what could be funded by a climate fund, right? So there's different options that we'll be presenting to you. Um, I kind of call them business as usual, a small boost and a medium boost, that's kind of the different options. Um, some of these programs we're already doing right now through our climate action plan and kind of the work that we've been able to fold into the staff capacity that we have. So energy efficiency outreach using existing stakeholders, home energy score programs, um, EV chargers, uh, transportation conversations within the city and then with also community partners. Those are kind of existing things we're doing. But overall, there's a bunch of different programs that fit within our existing climate action plan, um, but also match kind of some community need or would provide a community benefit. Um, there's things like emissions reductions, regulations, building code uh, conversations, neighborhood scale projects, public outreach and education, events, which we're not really doing right now, focus purely on climate, uh, electrification, incentives, rebates, things like that, that could be providing a value to community members, but we just simply don't have either the staff resources or the funds right now to support or the, you know, informational or or expertise that a consultant would be required for. So um, also, you know, things like natural climate solutions, tree planting programs, particularly for private property, habitat improvement for private property, those kind of things, which which could be folded within this and would provide clear uh, climate benefit. So with all of those kind of options, opportunities, you know, we're presenting to you today kind of these three different fund goals. And part of the question that we'll ask you at the very end is of these three fund goals, which one would you like us to uh, continue down the path of pursuing and bring back to you again? Um, so the first one is kind of that business as usual, what I mentioned for the 300,000. That would pretty much fund our existing personnel costs for my position, so around our climate work. Um, it would also fund each of these fund goals have a, a half-time code compliance, and that's just baked in for our tree code work uh, to support Tim's team, the code compliance team. Um, and it would leave kind of a little less than 95,000 or so for other programming. And that's to support essentially the programming work that we're doing already. And then also, you know, thinking about how things are just expanding and getting a little bit more expensive, giving us a good buffer in order to make sure that we can continue to offer those services, low income assistance programs if things are needed to expand, et cetera. Um, the 500,000 fund goal, this one um, essentially starts to include our urban forest team a little bit more. And so that would be pulling over our urban forester, uh, their position um, being funded through our this new climate fund. Um, it would also have a little bit more dollars for uh, programming, potentially maybe some small program expansions or maybe like one to three new programs. Once again, this is you know with our existing staff resources. Uh, so we would be lo probably looking to community groups in order to kind of help us with the implementation and running of those programs if needed. Um, just you know, because they're all, you know, if they're there, let's utilize them instead of bringing it in house at this time for this kind of fund. Um, and so this is why we call it the small boost. It's just a little bit extra um, in order to kind of keep us going and match with some of the speed of inflation. Um, and then the 750 uh, fund goal, this one is more of that medium boost. 
Um, it's nothing extreme. It's not kind of like a big rehaul of kind of our work that we're doing. It's just offering up um, the same kind of personnel as the 500, but some more programming dollars that could be used on consultants. They could be used on kind of new programs in Milwaukee, um, especially when we're looking towards things like commercial and business programs, which just are at a different scale, which um, the 500 and 300 bun, uh, goals just wouldn't be able to accommodate just thinking about you know, how much it costs for some of those improvements to be made. You have a question? Uh, you just in the yeah. personnel cost, why does it increase from the, if the personnel is the same, what's, where's the increase from the 315 mm -hmm. to the 460? Yeah, so that, what that would do is it would allow essentially a, a balance for seasonals or... Oh, this should be the same? Uh, oh, okay. okay. I was going to say, Thank so you. one thing that the difference in cost could also accommodate for, and it looks like we uh, mm -hmm. forgot to change that, but is seasonals, interns, consultants, any sort of additional staff that we could pay to assist us in kind of some programs. But those would have to be dependent on what the priorities were, right? So it could be going to consultants if it was all focused on something like legislation, or it could go towards seasonals if it was a project-specific kind of work. So... As recent meetings would point out, and as you talked about earlier, you are pretty tapped out time-wise. In all likelihood, the work you're doing now will cause us to meet our 2030 goal. The reason the 2035 goal was given an extra five years is because it's a lot more work, it's a lot harder, it's a bigger lift. and it's gonna take longer. Is there room in the 750K budget to bring on the additional staff that's gonna be required, not only to hit the 2035 goal, which as hard as that sounds, the 2040 goal is even harder, being completely carbon neutral by 2040. That's a giant lift. And it sounds like it's a long ways away, but given what has to happen in between those now and then, it's not a long ways away. It's, it's mm -hmm. coming fast. So to my mind, why I was interested in making sure that the funding for this portion of the work that we do was robust was so that staffing levels could be at what they need to be in order for us to actually hit those goals. So if, the, if, if that's a typo and 460 is not personnel costs and it's sticking at 315, how are we proposing to hit our 2035 and 2040 goals? So Mayor, since I made her move it, I'll probably take this one for her. Um, we don't know we don't know whether or not you all want specialized services or not. So there are certain attorneys that we're going to need for certain work. There are certain um, consultants out there that do specific services. And so we can move some of the dollars that we have for the policy and programming up into the personnel costs if it looks like those are not the priorities. And we can move the funds down into the programming as needed. But we just didn't want to promise that we were going to be hiring staff and then need another pot of funding to be able to meet the goals that council set. So specific to things like um, the natural gas, if we need to hire specific experts out in the field. We just didn't want to have, we, we wanted the flexibility to be able to do that. Peter, do you, you look like you want to come up. Why don't you I come up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, confirm what Ann, Ann was saying there. So, you know, the language that we have in there based on our needs at the time, we didn't want to necessarily give it and say that, yeah, we're going to, we're going to put another FTE there, but we wanted to make sure that we've considered the needs and the and the programs that we're working on uh, to make sure that we have the right you know the right team in place and in some cases that's a consultant to have that that expertise so well okay so i get i mean i do think like looking at the list that she had up before of potential some things are consultants some things like a solar 
push might be a limited term employee, right? It might be uh, like a, you know, the community solar and the working with the businesses to push solar and all of that. You know, I could see there's different solutions. It's maybe not a new FTE, uh, well, full, you know, go, yeah. uh, going onward. You know, there's different ways to do different pieces of it. I guess my more basic question is if the urban forester is properly paid for where it is now, why would we add it to this? Why would we not leave it as paid for in the stormwater and perhaps in the tree fees as they start coming in, right? Um, uh, and have more flexibility even at the mid level, at the small boost level to bring on those people to do that other work, whether it's consultants or, or term employees or whatever. I'm gonna let Natalie talk about that piece. Um, but the first piece I did just wanna reiterate, um, the other weird thing is that council sets outcomes, not staffing levels. So what's also making this a little complicated is that we were trying to be illustrative because I think that you all were interested in doing this to support ongoing funding that's similar to what we've been doing for the last couple of years that's involved staff. But at the same point, we're, when you receive the ordinance, it's not going to have any FTE in there. This is us trying to be transparent, but the reality is the budget will be set by the council at the time based on the priorities that the council at the time gives us. As long as those needs are met within the ordinance that outlines what the uses of those funds can be for. So I just wanna make sure we don't get too tied up on, now if you don't want us putting tree programming into this at all, then we would actually pull the policy work out of the fee as it's enabled rather than you telling us to fund the for forester here or fund it there. Does that make sense? So we're trying to help because I know this has been people based for the council for the last several years. But the reality of it is, um, you know, in when we do s the utilities, we do stormwater. We don't tell you how many FTE are going to be there. We tell you this is the work that's going to be on the CIP level. And this is the maintenance program that we need to maintain that. And that'll shift and flow back and forth over time. Peter and I are having those conversations about as we build bioswales, whether or not we have sufficient staffing to be able to maintain those bioswales or we need to actually shift some of the funding. So those conversations happen on a biennium basis. My commitment to you all is the programming that we're outlining tonight is what is going to get done based on the fee level you choose. If you don't want to find any of the tree programming in here, then we should not include it in those policies. Does that make sense, council member? Yeah, I, I okay. mean, I guess. Yeah. I, I hear what you're saying. Yep. But by the same token, so you, you're playing both sides of the same coin. I am. No, because I when I come to you and I say, we need to get started on the 2035 goal now, you say, we don't have the staff capacity. And then I say, okay, by which, which one of those funding levels gives me the staff capacity to do what I know we need to be doing right now? No, so the, I hear you. And that's why Natalie has all of these, these policies. Like if you set it at this lower level, she's saying you can get the existing home energy score program done. You can do the green tariff. You can do the rate at which we're performing tasks. If you add funding, you can perform the following tasks at this rate, right? So how we actually get to those outcomes may be through an employee she hires, but it may also be through a consultant. I just don't want us to get tied into the how. I want us to be focused on the what your expectations are of the fund and each of those levels have a different amount of work we can do based on that. But I've also heard people want to know numbers and they want to make sure that we actually have a team here that's doing the work. That's why we put the FTE in. But that's been the delicate balance we're trying to, to break here is I don't want um, in four years or five years somebody to come back and say, we said that we wanted another FTE and our answer is, but you also said you wanted this program done and this program required us to outline it in this way to construct it. It's actually, it's the budget process we all go through every year. But it's not helpful in this conversation because I think the way you and I have been talking about this for the last couple of years is more about people. 
So I just wanted to be to make sure it's clear that what you're choosing in the 300, 500, and 750 is how much programming you're paying for. And then Natalie and Peter and I will sit down and we'll figure out how we put those tools together to get that there. If what Councillor Beatty is saying is, I don't really want to put the tree programming in, I'd rather make sure we have more money for the sustainability climate services. We would remove the tree component. We'd take some of the other things from the 750 and we'd slide them into the 500 slot and we wouldn't have tree programming in your ordinance. I mean, I guess I feel like the tree, the for, urban forester we absolutely need, but if we're appropriately paying for her out of stormwater, it seems to me like she's really, you know, some stormwater, some actually streets probably, some, you know, I mean, she, she's safe. serving, you know, different, mm -hmm. she could properly be funded from different pools. And I wouldn't want to say, let's not do any tree work under this necessarily, but I just don't see why we would move her her FTE to be funded here versus having that flexibility for other work. Well, and part of what I also asked Peter to do, and he's working on it, is to come back with an update to the stormwater ordinance so that we're transparent about how we're funding things out of the stormwater ordinance as well. So right now it says, you know, MS4 permit and things like that. It doesn't say how trees meet us there. So he's also working on whether or not there needs to be changes in that ordinance to, to help clarify how all these fund balances are used. Um, and one thing I do want to highlight is, you know, as I mentioned, there's some challenges when it comes to kind of when we're thinking about climate programming involving trees in general, and then stormwater programming involving trees. So um, there's a program, if I were to come up with it off the top of my head, um, an education pro program helping folks learn how to prune trees on their private property and maintain trees on their private property. Um, while you know we're trying to really make the community know that trees everywhere, private or public, benefit to the stormwater system, that's why we have a private tree code or why that's an emphasis on our private tree code, there are challenges when we're kind of budgeting funds on taking public stormwater dollars and investing them on private property. And that's kind of something that we like to be transparent about. That's something that is blurring that line of uncomfort uh, for just that public utility fund. But so, I mean, what really is the legal difference between taking public climate funds and investing on a private property as opposed to investing public stormwater funds because that same rain that's not going to go in the stormwater systems being collected by those trees is affecting the public stormwater system just like those trees will be sequestering carbon to protect the climate for the public. Either way, it's apples and apples to me. Peter might actually be the right person. Well, and I, I just think there's some fuzziness probably on, on our stormwater management ordinance that we have on how, you know, for that, for that private side. Certainly it, 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 it considers that, you know, there's, there's watersheds that are in the community, but that, that drain, you know, that, that take the water when it rains and, and brings it to, you know, the water bodies, the Kellogg Creek, Johnson Creek, the Willamette. And, but it's not really, it's sort of fuzzy though in terms of the expenditures of those utility dollars on, on private infrastructure and or on private trees, on private property. So, I mean, we certainly do enforcement for in stormwater management work to make sure that, you know, properties are, are maintaining are, are following our rules in terms of stormwater and treating and holding water on their on their property. But you know the actual when, when we're looking at the the piece of of of, regu of, not, of private trees and investing on private trees on the properties, there's it's it's fuzzy there, right? It's not it's not really clear, and that's sort of what Anne's right, been. But I so, get that that is fuzzy. That part I get. Yeah. But why is it less fuzzy if it's climate out of coming out well, of the climate because, fund than if it's coming out of the stormwater? Well, fund? with our with this climate with the climate fund, there will be a new ordinance that sort of spells out that that it says uh, it's on that, private property. That, so it's we, just the fact that we didn't in our stormwater mm. thing spell out that that trees are important to stormwater management, and therefore we will support trees to some wherever they are. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think to some extent, yeah. But you for, do. sorry, just I wanna give an example because it's starting to get a little muddy. So we had an, a situation where a tree infiltrated a private water line. A tree we planted? No. Oh, okay. But it was on the border of, so part of it was on our public right of way, part of it was on private property. The issue becomes, we're not actually supposed to work on the other side of the line on the water line. It's supposed to be a plumber and it's supposed to be the homeowner's responsibility. What, how, how do we invest in that? And so part of this clarity is when, do, when can we use our funds to help benefit a private property owner when most of the time we require them to do the replacement of the pipe and those things are in ordinance. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to be, I, this is actually a great conversation. I think Peter and Natalie and I've tried to have it and it hasn't been as clear even as this one tonight. We're trying to make sure we're just super transparent of when we're investing in private spaces and when we're not. And in the climate fee, what I have heard from you all is private or public, you don't care as long as we are being, we're getting to our climate goals for the region. Mm -hmm. That's not the case in our other utilities. And so we're, what I think I hear Natalie saying um, is that urban forester is doing both. Sometimes they're in private, sometimes they're on public lands. Sometimes we're working on an ordinance that's about private lands. Sometimes we're working on an ordinance about public lands. Sometimes we're working on an industrial parcel. Sometimes, so some of the money could stay there but it would be disingenuous to say 100% should come out of stormwater when stormwater says we're on public property. Yeah, that, and that's all fair yeah. and I get it. I, I, but I think is, you can create something new. That's sure. what I'm saying with the climate fee is you could create something that says, if you want this to be 100% on private public, doesn't matter anywhere inside our boundaries, it can be spent. So, so, so my red flag yeah. with that, and I don't know if this was Lisa's red flag was okay, here we are, we're creating this new fund for a very specific purpose. Yep. And we're now gonna backfill another program, which arguably we have been more or less borrowing from to do some of this work now. So I get it. But what it goes back to for me is the question that I asked, right? We have a very, very clear climate action plan. We have three very clear and not easy goals. Totally. Which funding level gets us there? Well, I because think, you're telling me today, yeah. 250 does not get us there. Um, I think I'm telling you today that 250 gets you there on the path that we're going, knowing that we're probably going to get some federal money that's coming out just because the federal package is dramatically different. The, the, pu pu the public scene. This the year it scene is. is different. Yeah, totally. And we're gonna, we've got some opportunities with the state that's also gonna help us with some funding. So this isn't us saying that we have a plan today that I can guarantee actually you're gonna hit the goals with any of those amounts. I can't guarantee that. Do you want to go at the current rate? Do you wanna go at a, as she's calling it, a small boost rate? Do you wanna go at a medium boost rate? Um, we can't give you guarantees out of this, unfortunately. I wish we could, but I think Natalie and Peter and I would have hoped we were further along on the green tariff today than we are. Me both. But that's, but that's typical of everything we do. There's always gonna be like a, oh, we thought we'd be here on this, that one faster than we expected. And so, yeah. And we'll be, I mean, I think a portion of this and the reason why we're, we're trying to be generally flexible with even things like the, you know, policy and programming dollars is it's very dependent on what program opportunities exist at the time, what policy kind of priorities exist uh, for, for council. So, I mean, even if we bake money into a certain program, I you know, that program in five years time could be kind of dissolved and a new one could form. Um, so, I think it's, you know, as, as Ann mentioned, I think this is pretty illustrative and even like me throwing out, you know, one to three small programs, I can't tell you how many you can fund for that pot until I know kind of what type of program you want, in which case we can see if what's the most efficient way for us to roll it out. Sometimes it is baking it within city kind of operations and having us be the, the leaders in it. Sometimes it's partnering with an existing organization that's doing it. Um, but I think the inclusion of urban forest on here was really just kind of trying to 
um, fill kind of a conversation that we've been having around challenges for funding programs that lean towards the private property, even covering things like uh, habitat improvements on private property, which kind of are fuzzy around who or what balance should be paying for it because it's private. Well, and, and I would add too, I, I, I do think it's important to include funding, additional funding for our urban forest program. You know, we are, we have an urban forester. It's evolved over since 2017. I mean, that position started off as basically a landscape technician and we evolved it to become an urban forest. Urban forester, we adopted new public tree code and new residential private tree code. And you know the urban forester is focusing a lot of a lot of her time, frankly, on on that work. But to do some of the things that we need to do to achieve our 40% canopy goal includes funding more planting programs, more outreach and education programs. So you know those are dollars that we need to use to have available to go out and do that. You know we need the we need those resources to do that. And certainly we could, you know, there, there is a pot of money perhaps there in the stormwater fund to do some of those things. And we have done that in the past to some extent, but that's limited. You know, we want to, we have a lot of infrastructure needs, right? Those are competing, competing needs, right? We're going to see more, more rainfall in the winter, more intense changes in, in the weather. And we want to make sure that that infrastructure is sufficient to handle the changing climate. You know, one way to do that is also planting more trees, right? But this is a mechanism to do that, that we know that we have something that's at least a little bit, a little bit more dedicated to that, right? We, do, we, we did also establish a tree fund as part of our uh, tree code updates. You know, that's sort of supplementary in nature. You know, that's just basic permits and fines. That's not something that we can, you know, rely on to fund a, a large program, but it's, it's, it's dollars that are going there that we can use. I think as Courtney mentioned, I think at a study session update, we actually haven't received any type two permits yet. Or oh, actually we haven't approved any of the folks who kind of submitted a type two, we talked to them in conversation on why they're moving the tree and they actually didn't proceed with the permit. So we actually haven't collected any funds at all. And all the permits we've been giving out are type ones, which are free. So it's kind of uh, that fund balance hopefully shouldn't be relied on because hopefully it will, it will remain low, um, it, but it will kind of supplement if we do need to do planting programs, kind of what, what maybe inventory we need to purchase for that. Right, and I, I don't want you to get the sense that I don't think trees are an important part of and, and should not be funded out of this. I'm just going back to the big picture and I'm saying, tell me how much you need to meet our goals. And I could tell you millions of dollars and I, I don't know. So I think that what we've, we've said here is, Natalie actually made a really cool list of all the programming options. Um, we can come back when we come, you know, if you guys generally say, this is, this is the type of things we want in there and this is how much we're approving, then we can come back to you at the meeting when we adopt this and say, okay, these are the things that we believe you wanted funded in here. These are the things that are now in here. And if, and these are the things we took out. So you can see the things that we're not funding in here. If, if we're not putting trees in here, then the tree stuff is gonna sit on the other side of that, that table. So we can provide you all that. Um, but I, I, I mean, I work for Salt Lake City. We had five staff people doing sustainability work. It was an incredible group of humans. There's now six people doing that work and they're not, they haven't, they haven't hit their goals. And I, I don't know when they're going to, I'm meeting with their director on Friday. So it's not me, I'm not trying to obfuscate here. I actually, I can't technically tell you what it's gonna take because we're still making these rules up as we go as to how much work and the type of work it's gonna take to hit them. I just know I have the right people on the team. Well, and some of them are state, you know, depend on what happens at the state level. And at the Fed. I mean, and I, I would add too, I, I, I think with what we set out there on, on the, you know, the business as usual, the, the, the small boost and the medium boost, you know, like Ann said, you know, we could always use more money, but, you know, in the context of, of 
what we charge our, our residents and businesses for the, the services that we provide, you know, we're, we're sensitive to that. So, you know, we want, you know, it's hard for us to, as staff to come back and say, hey, give, we us, win it all. give us $3 million to do this work because we, we know that that's gonna impact, uh, that, that impacts a fee. So, you know, we are, are, are really sensitive to that and, you know, certainly look for guidance from council on what, what, what does council feel comfortable? Mm -hmm. What is the best fit for, for the community and what you hear from, you know, from the residents, so. Uh, and we will be doing part of the outreach and we'll cover it in the timeline too, is the community survey that we're gonna be doing along with some of the stakeholder um, outreach is asking what services would you like, expect from the city related to some of these climate action programs. So, um, you know, we're gonna be presenting folks with kind of a, what have you done already? Did you feel supported? Uh, what would you like to do? How do you think the city should, you know, be involved in that uh, type of survey and to really see kind of what the interest is. And I think that will kind of help us after we have this conversation and, you know, you can present kind of what your thoughts should be on the fund balance. And then we'll kind of take that community feedback on what they're hoping to get. And we can either mismatch, see if we can achieve everyone's goals, say, hey, there's this gap, but at least we have a, a starting point in order to kind of like guide the conversation. Um, and I did just want to show you, I mean, this is just expanded a little bit more. This would be that medium boosted program if we included urban forest and uh, climate programs. Once again, these are kind of picking and choosing. It's all very with a big caveat of what are the priorities and how do we want to make sure to adjust these to match the community's needs. So maybe the community is way more interested in building electrification rather than transportation programs. Um, that's just something that we'll have to be flexible with, or maybe if council is interested in one versus the other, we'll just be flexible. Um, but these are kind of, um, you know, the build out of if we were to continue expanding programs, what it could look like depending on kind of some topics and um, essentially priorities. Yeah. Um, and then, so let me just show you the timeline that we're kind of looking at. So. Today, we're talking about the structure and funding opportunities, and hopefully we're gonna get some feedback on that that we can continue chewing on and working. We're gonna start outreach to the community with big focuses on just increasing awareness of the ongoing discussion right now. Um, and then also, what programs and services would the community want? And that's to really help guide us when we're thinking about what funds are appropriate for what we're hearing from the community to really balance out that conversation to make sure that we're kind of considering everything for you also to have more information just to consider uh, next time we visit. Um, also in September, I'm just gonna be, uh, Jordan and I um, and uh, other staff will be kind of in a flurry of kind of creating some materials uh, and kind of scheduling some of these stakeholder engagement opportunities. We're hoping to have focus groups with both the uh, Community Utility Advisory Board as well as our business and industrial community members. Um, and FCS Group will be helping us with that, Todd and Martin. Um, and then in October, uh, really that's kind of the launch of something like a survey. We'll be doing a pilot article. Um, we'll be having those stakeholder groups. Uh, our survey, we're hoping to have uh, inform folks through a postcard of some other mailing, have it on Engage Milwaukee. I'm also hoping to have it on an iPad or two at our Arbor Day celebration, which is on October 22nd. And that's gonna be in downtown Milwaukee if folks are interested. Uh, there's also gonna be an electric tool exchange again at that um, Arbor Day, so we're really excited about it. Um, in November, uh, we're gonna be doing another pilot article. We're actually gonna be working with our finance team to do a utility bill stuffer. Um, that's actually something that we've been exploring for Public Works for some outreach around our programming in Public Works anyways. Um, continued survey if needed, if we feel like we didn't get enough responses or we wanna continue the conversation. Um, and then, you know, there's a few different council sessions. So there's one in uh, end of November that we can come back to, or if we want more time, we can come in uh, December and we'll just make sure to correct any sort of outreach engagement or um, add more if needed. Um, if in December or November, um, council decides to adopt a fund option. Just so you know, we don't have a meeting on the 22nd. You know, it's actually I was, November 15th. Thanks. Heard that earlier and yeah. I had flashes going through my head of slides. Um, yeah, so uh, November 15th would be the council session. 
Um, but uh, in December or November, essentially whenever we have a decision, we'll want to do kind of similar outreach, just making sure folks are aware of what was decided, how they're going to see that change. Um, and then uh, pretty much the fee would be starting to accrue starting January 1 or July 1, depending on what council decides. Uh, and also, I just want to, um, I'm not sure you've talked to Michael yet. He talked to me this week, so I apologize in advance oh, yeah. that I haven't said this to you. Uh, we also are going to have to reformat the bill for, for our entire utility bill because this pushes us onto a second page. That actually takes several months to get the, the reformatting done and to get everything out. So the likelihood is, is that this would probably start about March 1. We would have it implemented. The code would start applying on January 1, but I just wanted to be transparent that the collection wouldn't start until probably March. The nice thing is, is that we already have funds through the budget process dedicated to this program through the entire budget cycle. So we're not in need of them. It's not that those funds are going away, but we wouldn't be able to start offsetting until March. And then um, one thing with the creation of a climate fund is we'll just want to make sure, and that's something that could be supported through those dollars, is staff time on reporting out. And that includes, um, you know, a work plan, including, um, you know, establishing progress metrics. If there are programs, if folks want essentially more formalized kind of quantitative numbers, that's definitely something that we can look at and just making sure that we're choosing the appropriate metrics to report out to either council, community, dashboards, et cetera. So more than that, I would be interested in a process where we go back to our climate action plan mm -hmm. and then we do back casting. Some of the Is everybody that, familiar with mm -hmm. the concept of back casting? Some of the, the technologies and pieces don't exist yet. So we can go back and backcast, but just so you know, there are certain things that we're not, the, te the technology around massive trucking industry EVs is still developing. So I just wanna be cautious about assuming, we're gonna have to make a bunch of assumptions into the backcasting. We will, and there are some aspects that we won't be able to be particularly accurate. There are also aspects that we can, and that we would inform what we're doing today. Okay, I, I've got to plead ignorance. I'm not familiar with backcasting. Okay, so backcasting is basically s saying, okay, uh, in 2035, uh, we are um, net zero building energy or fully electrified or however you want to phrase that. So that means that by 2033, we have to be 80% oh, okay. there. By 2031, we have to, you know, that means because until we start sort of living into the reality of what it's gonna to take to get there, because it feels so far away, I fear that we will not be taking the actions that need to be taken as early as they need to be taken. So that's why I'm recommending backcasting because it's a really good process for level setting mm -hmm. and for creating awareness around the difficulty of getting to where we're trying to go and the things that it's gonna to take to do it. Does the rest of the, so a couple of things, we've got six meetings left. Six meetings left what? So you're off this council. Yes, I know that. I know, so we're, we're, we were already tight on time to be able to- I'm not asking for backcasting before I leave. But you are before you set the rate or are you not before you set the rate? Before what? You, are you set willing to set no. the rate tonight? Okay. Uh, I mean, okay. at this point. Is this you, related to the work plan kind of yes. moving forward? So when you see. It, that helps. No, that helps the, the me. Whole, the reason that occurred to me is the whole reporting out thing, right? And it's lovely. But what we know for a fact is we're not anywhere close. So saying we are two and a half percent better than we were two years ago. Great. You know, that's less important to me personally than moving faster. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a concern putting that on a future work plan. I really thought that you meant before the next six meetings. No. So no. as long as we're not trying to have that conversation before we set the rate, we no. will, we can add that to a work plan. No, and I would have done it a while ago, but 
there was the issue of staffing, right? How much bandwidth there was. And so I have... And we've done a little of that work. I mean, we did the carbon calculator when it came to our electric utility in order for us to, to kind of have a idea of the gap to close by a certain um, by a certain year. And that's something that we can reshare on when we come up with a part of this as a web page and such like that to kind of share information. And that's definitely something we can reshare. Yeah. And one thing, you know, with a work plan that would, and I'm big on with progress metrics is, avoiding percentages if possible and actually having like what, how many number of solar installations would it take? And then that way it could be translated into maybe more metrics that we already track here at the city to really kind of alleviate some of the workload and increase the understandability of it to the community on kind of how they could see, you know, number of public chargers would be helpful. Um, but that's definitely something that can be built into a work plan. And the value of that would be that it would be more frequent, right? Because right now we have essentially every five years is how part of our coming back with this more formalized document of where we are and where we need to go. And um, having more of an annual work plan with these established metrics associated with the fund could keep us more accountable on the annual basis. The, the carbon calculator that we put together two and a half years ago is a really useful tool to do the back casting that you're talking about. So, you know, it's built in uh, the changes to the RPS, the changes to, you know, and, and it captures our changes in our consumption behavior as a community used for, for electricity. So as people pull in it, it, and identifies the gap that we have year to year to, to, to hit our goal. Yeah, I think you're actually asking us just to do our work differently. So we can do our work differently, but all anytime we make a change, it is more it is staff time. And if we have more staff, great. If we have more consultants, great. If we have right, so it's not but I think what you're asking and I appreciate how Natalie and Peter are talking about it. It's just us looking at it differently ongoing. Okay. And so if there are any remaining questions on kind of the timeline and kind of what program opportunities we're looking at, I'm going to pass it over to Todd and he's going to talk a little bit more about some of the work that him and Martin have been doing on the fee itself. I do actually have a yeah. question. Um, I, or it's more of a, it's, it falls more on the concern side when mm -hmm. I see what programs or services would the community want. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to say this delivers X amount of carbon reduction or something along those lines. What I'm trying to get at is what the public thinks they want is often the really catchy feely stuff that doesn't actually result in emissions reductions. And I have a real problem with that because your time, the time everybody spends on this is valuable and what we're trying to get to is carbon emissions reductions, not everyone feeling good about how they're living their lives. Mm -hmm. So um, when we're building out a survey, a big thing that we're gonna be doing is focusing on quantitative data collection, but then also we're gonna be presenting options. And I think the options that we're selecting are ones that are tangible, they're kind of, um, familiar to folks, things like incentives to install EV chargers or help purchase EVs in the community, something like that, which offers some uh, generalities. So that way we can kind of build what programs help support that. But then at the same time, focus it on, like we can pull away from it. Electrified transportation is something that's of interest or um, tree planting. And I think, I, I mean, I think we want to ask questions also that allow the public to develop a better understanding of what they're getting for paying this fee, right? Yeah. So absolutely. it's hard. I mean, if we're, if we're talking about carbon reduction and you know keeping the temperature, that's you know that's not something that that uh, translates well to to the general public. So it's like I'm paying this fee. What am I getting for it? So you know, and those are we're looking for feedback on how can we assist you to help us mm -hmm. help help the community achieve the goals, right? Yeah, and, and I think, you know, I'm, and I'm sorry, I'm getting wordsmithy here. It's what happens when you keep the gremlins out after midnight. Um, but uh, I'm thinking about things like, you could offer the option of weatherization services for low income residents, renter or owner, whatever, um, and then have some sort of information that says, this is one of the biggest bang for your buck kinds of investments we can make for climate change. 
Uh, so just like those little nuggets of information sprinkled in there, I think would be really helpful to contextualize it so that we don't just get, I don't know, switch everyone to in the in the entire city to compostable plates. I'm just oh, right. pulling that <laughs> over here, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh yeah, and that's something we can do. I mean, the platforms we're looking at for a survey like Engage Milwaukee do allow us to kind of hyperlink out. We can have, offer supplemental information. Why are we looking at these types of programs? That's definitely stuff that we can provide context to. Do you any other questions? Great. Okay, so I'm gonna pass it off to Todd then. So, <clears throat> so a couple quick observations. I you know, commend you have for having an excellent climate action plan and a great start, for Natalie and Peter. Uh, but as you know, uh, plans without dedicated sources of funding never get fully implemented. Um, it almost doesn't matter what kind of plan it is. But what we're talking about is a dedicated source of funding for implementation of this plan. And like any utility, usually you come back every three to five years and revisit your revenue and your revenue requirements and right size it, change some of your administrative procedures and recalibrate it. And so it's not gonna be perfect coming out of the box, I'm sure, but it will be a good start. And what we intended to do with our, our role here was to try to find a nexus between climate impacts and, and charges and different ways to charge it in a fairly efficient way so that you don't need to hire an FTE just for the billing purposes. Um, we looked at four basic types of charging this fee, whether it's the low model, medium or midsize. But uh, the first was a charge based on basically water usage and water accounts. And we can easily do that using your utility service fee customer charge database. Um, it gets to the use of water as one, as one type of um, action customers take, but it doesn't get to the other types of actions people take. Um, the other, uh, second one in, we considered charging it uh, as a business license fee. And that gets to the business customers, not the residential customers. And it would be based on your similar business license fee methodology, which takes into account full-time employment at locations in the city. So that would be, and take into account transportation by res, non-residential customers, uh, but it doesn't get into some of the other issues. Um, the third one over is based on transportation impacts. And that would uh, utilize your, your current transportation utility fee, stormwater utility fee model as well. Um, fairly easy to implement. Um, but again, it doesn't get into some of the other issues or the, and impacts. And then the one we landed on, our preferred option that we'd recommend is a charge that actually measures an estimated amount of greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 emissions for different customer types, residential and non-residential. And then we assess that based on transportation impacts through your stormwater utility charge. So it, the charge actually takes into account. Just a correction, that would be through the SSMP billing structure that we put together, not the stormwater. Okay, SSMP, I'm sorry. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. But the charge actually takes into account uh, the business or customer type, whether it's industrial, service, residential, single family, multifamily, uh, or retail and the size in terms of square feet for heated cooling and, and, um, and heated floor area and cooled area, as well as their power consumption. And we pulled out the, um, the green energy consumption from their overall power usage when we did the allocation. So we really tried to get that zeroed in on uh, carbon emissions. And that was the one we recommend and then we'll take it to the next slide and here you can see what the rates would need to be at those three different funding points. Um, you need to realize we didn't put in the large boost. 
We just have the. Uh, we do. You have the. We uh, just go. The business as usual will be right. the blue, and then you have the small, small as the, uh, and the red, and then and the medium. The medium, no large. But there we go. So the uh, you can see at the three hundred thousand uh, per year level, we need a monthly charge for dwelling unit of about a dollar twenty-eight. And at the 750,000 level, we need $3.20 per single family detached home. Um, the multifamily rate at the one of the last council meetings, you instructed us to try to vary that, to take into account the fact that multifamily uh, households tend to be smaller. They tend to use a little less energy. Um, and, and so we did have some factors to take that into account. So we reflected that here. And we also, in all these rates, assumed that there'd be no charge for rent-restricted uh, low-income housing. So we pulled that out and reallocated that, that revenue. And Is there also an opt-out for low-income folks who aren't necessarily? There's a lot of people who don't have the luxury of having a rent-restricted apartment but are equally low-income. I, I think you we did account for those low income uh, assistance programs as well. Okay. Well, I, yeah, we have a number, and that's one of those calibration factors I mentioned that we can come back every year or two and recalibrate that if needed. But we do have a number based on uh, what we've, with the information we do have. <clears throat> and then the other fees for non residential customers would be based on the Surface Streets Management Program billing units and that would uh, that's driven by a number of factors but it's basically equates to trips that that user would generate um, on an average daily basis i believe and so that's how it would uh, range again from services uh, you can see the 24 cents per unit uh, at the 300,000 level um, same level, 300,000 level, the retail would be 13 cents. That was surprisingly low, I know, but um, I think it's because they have limited hours of operation primarily, and um, you know, they tend to be smaller users in general. So break out the difference between services and retail and why one is double of the other, because so, uh, so well, maybe maybe define what services are first. Well, retail is pretty um, evident. Um, so it's retail is basically where there's a uh, retail distribution to a consumer. Right. So it could be grocery stores, drug stores, apparel stores, all those types of stores. Restaurants would be in services. I was going to wonder about that because you had yeah. called out your when you were here before you showed restaurants as a separate item. Mm -hmm. okay. And these are existing classifications within the SSM facility. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, restaurants, lodging establishments, um, office buildings tend to fall into services. Okay. So before you put this slide up, you were saying that it was based in part on transportation impacts, so trip generation, but also on size of floor area. So how do you calculate that and how do you know that? And what, what we found out is that we can understand the power usage by these categories in the city of Milwaukee. And then we have the square feet for all these categories in the city of Milwaukee as well. We have an estimate of that, of covered floor area for square feet. And so we've, we've been able to drive up, uh, and then we put that into the model and it, it tells us what the carbon emissions are per square foot of different types of uses. And I think the key is when, when kind of developing these different fee structures, particularly on the administration of them, is using existing metrics that we're already collecting through our programs and having to essentially make sure, especially if we have the opportunity to update them, that we are essentially not, you know, going off and, and generating something new that will then take a significant amount of time to update each time. Um, you know, FCS group, Martin and Todd and team have essentially used our existing program metrics that we collect for businesses, services, commercial, multifamily, residential, 
which can be, you know, a challenge for them, I'm sure, but it's, it will help us in the long run when it comes for, for staff time for updating these. So where would uh, a distribution center fall? Is that services or is that industrial? Industrial. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, are there any other questions on this? So really then what we're just here to ask is um, of these three different options, uh, which one would you like us to kind of continue pursuing and kind of create and craft outreach around it? That's kind of our goal is to kind of have this framework in mind so we can be realistic when we're communicating to community members, what type of programming we'd be looking at. Um, and then are you still interested in having the, the greenhouse gas option that Todd just presented be the, the one that we want to pursue. So for me, uh, yes to the second question and the medium boost to the first question. If you can't guarantee me that we hit our goals even at that, I want the best fighting chance that I can get to hit those goals. <clears throat> so before you had given us a calculation of like what the bill would be to the biggest user and that, um, you know, I, I do think that's something that we might want to see, but um, I guess in my view, yes, I guess answer the second question, yes. Um, I answer the first question that I think the small boost, if it only, if we were only were funding a smaller portion of, of urban forest work and not the whole position, um, could actually be a medium boost. I mean, could actually be substantially more than business as usual. Um, and so I think I'm concerned about the impact on, you know, both residential and business users. $2.28? What can you buy for $2.28? <laughs> well, I mean, I do think, yeah, I mean, I, I do think, I don't, Go back and show the price. Sorry, three three twenty. Three twenty. Same question. You can't you can't even buy a cup of coffee. Right, but we I mean we are yeah. No. I mean we Yeah. It is less the I mean I do think the impact on the residential is not onerous. Um, I don't know that we have enough here to know what the impact is on the businesses, but I guess that's the point of the outreach. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I guess I have some trepidation about going for the whole enchilada. <laughs> so on, on the, at the high end, the large for the large industrial customer. I'm, I'm just looking back at some old notes. It was about uh, eleven eighty three a month. Eleven thousand. No, eleven hundred and eighty three dollars a month. I'm sorry. One more time. So, for the seven fifty, and that was our, our biggest our industrial. Large, our, our large. large one thousand one hundred and fifty per month, month for the largest. Inter okay. Yeah. Hmm. Sorry, when you start switching over into 1150, it gets a little yeah. muddy. And if there are, I mean, not to add another question to it, but you know, if there are key programs that, that you're interested in, um, you know, that also helps us and I can bring that back as well and kind of talk about where that could fit in, in each of these fund options, particularly when it comes to things like having clarity. And that's one of the goals, hopefully, from some of these surveys is even around our urban forest program, if there's gaps, 
because if we kind of proceed as usual or even kind of with some of that small boost and don't pull funding away from storm uh, to support urban forestry, it's gonna kind of proceed with business as usual for urban forestry because we're not inflating those storm dollars to account for any inflation and in programming on that end. Right, and so at business as usual, do we hit our 2040 goal? For canopy expansion? Yes. It would be a challenge. Um, I think there's a lot of outreach and programming that we have. It looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, just even thinking right now, you know, we have our private tree code, um, but that's for residential only. And so we would need to look at commercial industrial code. Um, there's also just private property plantings and kind of private property programs around maintenance and stuff like that, where, you know, we recognize there's barriers to trees and tree ownership. And right now we are working at full speed, making sure that our public trees in particular are cared for. And even then, you know, we're, we're racing around. And so it's kind of a, we're doing a good job and I don't wanna minimize the work that we're doing, but it's also a, you know, a big canopy goal. And I think that we can get there. And uh, it just depends. That's also a, you know, willingness of the community question. It's also a, does council see urban forestry as a key climate action? Or do you wanna focus more on a different renewable energy or something like that else? That's another one. So I know $1.28 doesn't sound like a lot to anyone, but um, I know that when our residents get their bill, they don't just look at $1.28, they look at what they're paying for their water, they look at the fees that the school is charging, they look at the NCPRD fees, they look at, you know, to them it is all kind of the same thing. Um, and so I, I'm not comfortable saying that a dollar twenty-eight doesn't matter, and I'm really not comfortable saying three dollars and twenty cents doesn't matter. Um, to people who are already choosing between paying the rent or paying their electric bills. But we are we're having a low income opt out. Yes, and we also know that the participation rate in low income programs is disproportionate to the need because people are ashamed to use them. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, but I'm not saying that that, I also don't buy that that solves the problem on its own. Um, so uh, when you uh, when you ask my opinion, this is what I'm gonna tell you. I have, I, I wanna give some pushback on the assertion that these, these amounts don't matter to our residents. And we have not engaged with our business community to know what those impacts are there. Um, I say all this, you know, I would love to have the $500,000 or $750,000 options, uh, um, you know, all things being equal. Um, but I keep thinking about how the previous council spent a year engaging with the community around the safe fee and we're trying to do this in three months. And that's a really compressed timeline and it's, it's ambitious and you've got a great outline. All of that um, this is not knocking you. I'm just, um, I'm worried about being able to tell the story in a way that really allows the community to understand. And I'm worried about whether or not we get the feedback we really need to make an informed decision about um, how these things are impacting folks. So we had, we need an answer though. Where are you at? <laughs> Sorry. Are you at the 300,000 level? Is that what we're hearing? I'm closer to that than I am to 750, that's for sure. So we're gonna, part of why we're asking is we're gonna be doing an article in the pilot tomorrow and we're going to talk about this based on this feedback. So we are actually trying to get kind of a sense for which which amount of money we're telling people about. Yeah. Um, 
I key. am hearing that you're fine with the mechanism. Is that correct? The mechanism is fine. Okay. And you know, when I am looking at this and I'm thinking back to the thing that was said earlier in the presentation, any utility plan changes every three to five years. So even if we start out at 300,000, that doesn't mean we stay there. Okay, and so it, for right now you're at three? Okay, Why are do you, you want to talk me? I know when no, everyone we've got else. Two more, we've got two more people who can talk, but I do just want to make sure that I'm everybody is my answer. that everybody is prepared. Tonight we do need as a general sense of where the vote is so that we can figure this out. Do you want to take a break and we'll come back to you? I would like to take okay, a break. There you yeah. go. And I think, you know, the reason why we're seeking clarity too is because my big fear is I don't want to overpromise to the community and, sure. and convince folks that we're going to be all of a sudden having these incentive programs and such when we're not. No, it's a terrific that, question. It's just a hard one. Yeah. That's all. And I think the incentive thing is key. So the reason, because I, I acknowledge everything that everyone's saying here, obviously. Uh, the opt out, the low income opt out is, is key. Um, I'm leaning more towards the 750, and the reason for that, as much as I'm an anti-fee kind of guy, especially considering where everyone is at right now, I'm looking at it like that 750,000, that $3.20 a month that people pay could lead to incentives that bring their utility bills down overall in general. So like, for example, if we have that funding, that could be towards, okay, we're gonna incentivize people to uh, insulate their homes, which will then bring down CO2 emissions from homes and which will then bring down their electric bills or their energy bills in general. Um, so that's one avenue. But that can also be funding for, we're looking at banning natural gas. We're talking about batteries being the issue when the power goes out. That could be funding to incentivize putting batteries in new construction so that we don't really have to rely on natural gas. So I'm looking at it like as much as it's 320 and as much as it is, you know, trust me, I'm on a fixed income too. I'm working three jobs. Um, as much as it is difficult, I look at it as a potential to have incentives that will bring down the overall cost of living is how I view it. If I'm looking at it a little bit too optimistically, I apologize, but that's just based on this presentation from the incentives and the programs and those things that we have, we have an opportunity to pretty much eliminate that 320 just off incentives. So that I, I'm more towards the 750 and the, the funding option of the greenhouse gases as well. Cause I, I feel like this is, we get the climate action off, then we can actually start focusing on cost of living stuff and that kind of thing. So really try to mitigate the addition of this through those incentives. Yeah. And it puts us towards our path and our goal. I mean, faster than 300,000 water, 500,000. That, that's a great point. Just putting up electric charging stations that are public in the areas around multifamily residential units where those folks don't have that opportunity gives them the opportunity to switch to an electric car which is gonna save them a lot of money every month. But the average price of an electric vehicle is 66,000. So thinking that people are gonna be out buying electric vehicles to plug in, that's a huge assumption. It's leaf for $10,000 right now. Who in a low income home has $10,000 to buy? The low income people aren't being charged this fee. Uh, okay. So I, I understand that, but we can't sit here and make assumptions that these folks are going to be able to afford to buy a brand new electric car, right? Well, I mean, I think that's a fair some fair statement, but the sixty six thousand is crazy. I mean, no, my no, electric no, car cost me twenty eight thousand. Uh, <laughs> a study came out today. I listened to it on NPR. The average price of an electric vehicle is $66,000. It's because they're $200,000 ones. Right. And I'm not, I'm not even talking about electric okay. cost of an automobile. Okay, regardless. I, I'm not even talking about electric vehicles. I'm just talking about yeah, yeah. electric Yeah, no, no, I, yeah. yeah. I'm leaning more towards the 50,000 or 500,000. I think you have to be careful when you're like, you know, a cup of coffee doesn't cost, you can't buy a cup of coffee for 320. There's still people who are like on the verge, on the edge, of low income and we have to we have to balance it out. We just can't you can't throw that out like, well what can you buy for 320? Well there are some things folks can buy for 320 who are like struggling to stay above the poverty line. <clears throat> and we we just can't be cavalier about that. I I you know it's important 
all this is important. I'm, I'm totally cool with the way we get it. I just, I know when people look at their bills, they're gonna see a big increase. And when you're like worried about paying your bills, and I know there's a low income opt out, I'm talking about the people who are on the verge, who are like paycheck to paycheck staying above that line. And we have to think about those folks because I think there are a lot of, a lot more of those folks out there than low income, you know, than folks that are using the opt out for low income, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. yeah. right? I will say that, that this is kind of the direction that council can provide us when we're looking at different program opportunities is ones that kind of have incentives, um, ones particularly, I mean, one gap that I've noticed even myself in taking advantage of programs are things like you mentioned new electric vehicles, local, you know, incentives or rebates for used. That's something that's not often provided or kind of easily explained, low barrier uh, incentives. That could be something that, that we explore. Um, so this feedback is great because it does help us kind of direct potentially some of the program opportunities. And that's kind of something that we are asking on the surveys around incentives for things like this to see if folks would actually be interested in them. Yeah, and you know, I can get to 500,000 if, if we are really working to emphasize, um, and it's not necessarily that that money is directly going to create incentives. I think the money probably goes to create the pathways to those incentives. You know, the state of Oregon and the feds both are rolling out programs that will help pay for um, EVs for lower income folks. So I think the work isn't, let's create a $500 cash rebate. It's let's do an education yes. program that helps connect these people to these things, you know. Um, some of those like insulation and I mean, I do think there will be other, there's already some um, state money for that. And I think there will be more out yeah, of the- there is, yeah. out of the bipartisan infrastructure yeah. bill. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if the work is on how, how can we make our community more nimble in connecting between the resources that are out there and the people who just don't have the time to find them um, and the people who will benefit the most from getting them, then I can get there. Um, and I think that's a story that's gonna be really critical for us to tell. And I just wanna highlight that in our surveys, almost always our community outreach is disproportionately represented um, very high income families. Um, and, and so this is why I kind of go back to that nuggets of information because I, I think that reusable coffee cups are awesome. Don't get me wrong, I am not knocking re reusable coffee cups one second. I have the privilege of thinking about this as, and purchasing it. And so I look at that and go, yes, I want reusable coffee cups. I may not think about home weatherization as a person of privilege. So that's why I want to really stress that contextualization um, when that, that survey goes out and when that outreach is done to ask for feedback mm -hmm. on how to do things um, from the community. Mm -hmm. I think that's in alignment with a lot of the work that we've been doing. I mean, that's why we've been pursuing more utility scale options that aren't just rooftop solar, knowing that a lot of folks can't afford rooftop solar. Um, and I think we can continue to do that. So I just want to make sure I hear what I'm hearing so that we can get the article out tomorrow. So the first is it sounds like we have three for 500 and we have two for 750. So right now. No, I meant 500. So I think that that means then we're going to price this around that. I'm, I'm hearing some conflation around the arborist role inside the 500. So what I'd like to recommend is that we look at how we proportionately share the private property portion of the tree work into the fund. So it'll be a lower amount, <clears throat> but it will still be, we have to have some if we're going to keep doing the work we're doing. And, and that will give us a little more money going the other direction towards more of the, the climate specific items. 
Um, is am I reading that right? Generally, everybody's on board for that. Okay, so we will work on that um, in the coming week. Natalie has a lot of work to do in the morning um, to come up with the list of what we're going to publish out to the community. But I think we hear you. We'll we'll take fewer tree components into the program, but we will still have some in there. We'll focus on on the incentives. I'm also hearing as being the primary of, of getting people connected to incentives. Maybe not producing them ourselves, but connecting people to incentives. Okay. Anything else that we need to hear from you all? And then a 5-0 on this is the right mechanism and this is the right structure. Okay. Thank you. Thank I you. I know this is a ton of work. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thanks, everyone. This meeting. I believe after the regular session, council will meet as the Milwaukee Redevelopment Commission. The commission will meet in person at City Hall and on the same Zoom meeting. Don't go anywhere if you'd like to watch that meeting. With that I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Five minute break. Having really? fun with the script, are you? No, we just, we like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark sounded kind of like he was. Oh, okay. He was like, if you want to stay, <laughs> you can. <laughs>